think what we have here in Hollywood is high art. It's party time, Bad time to take a drink. Good morning, <laughs> everyone. Welcome back to season three of the failed award contenders on the Waffle Press retrospectives. I'm your host, Diego Crespo. With me today is my co-host, Matt Garingo. Yes, I am. Matt, it's great to be back. We're very excited to be here. We're very excited to talk about all the 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 nominees for our poll in the failed award contenders this year. The winners that we're going to talk about, actually. Uh, we're not going to talk about the losers. But uh, I also wanted to take this time to mention that I'm really appreciative of everyone who voted in those polls. Um, that was very exciting to see people... Uh, like argue about whether or not like what movies would be more fun for us to cover versus what would be the better movies to cover just in general um dan and ethan are correct by the way though the real waffle press fans are the ones who (laughs) wanted matt and i to suffer um but i also wanted to say that like matt and i we love doing the show we're very excited to be back um uh, this episode is sponsored by our patreon it'll be up there early uh basically we also kind of need to be able to devote more time and resources to this uh, if we want to keep doing it. And it's it, this isn't like a threat that we're going to stop doing it or anything like that, I want to reiterate. But I also want to say that, yes, it's sponsored by our Patreon because um, we need to start kind of making uh, something off of this. <laughs> um, and so if you have any other uh, suggestions for like like brands or, or anything, if you like certain coffee stuff, I'll reach out. I've reached out to a couple brands already. So we'll, if you start hearing me hawk stuff on this podcast or the regular hangouts that's why um but now that that business is out of the way matt we're here to talk about our first episode of the season damien chazelle's babylon diego shut the fuck up okay i want to talk about vtubers again because uh is it relevant to babylon no actually it is but uh all right today is the ninth we're recording on a Friday, right? Uh, no, it's Monday morning. Huh? Oh, yeah. It's whatever. it's Monday morning. You know what? We were supposed to record on a Monday this week, and then I delayed it because my hardwood floors are getting repaired. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm glad we did because on Monday of this week, the world of VTubers fucking exploded um, in a very Babylon-esque way. And it feels like we maybe are at the end of a certain era in the VTubing world. Or nothing will happen. <laughs> Those are the two things <laughs> that could happen. Uh, heads up, this is going to be a bit of a bummer of a discussion. But uh, Oh, good. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, I, it's like Babylon in, a, in similar ways. So if you've seen the movie Babylon, get ready. Um, all right. When was the, the last time we discussed VTubers was the Hugo episode, correctly? Correct? I'm pretty sure that's, like... I'm sure you brought it up after that, but that's, like, the time you brought it up, and I was like, where did this come from? That was the main thing. And that one I did... I gave Diego a heads-up this time. I did not give him a heads-up for that episode. Um, (laughs) But uh, in that episode, I I mentioned that I was following a VTuber for the first time, a guy by the name of Vox Akuma, mainly because he did a stream supporting... Uh, the SAG and uh, writer strikes, and I was like, "This guy seems all right." Um, now, what do you, what other than what I've told you? What do you know about VTubers, like the industry of VTubers? Uh, <clears throat> oh, the industry, I don't, I don't know anything. Don't, yeah, because I think I've actually been very like minimum on discussing that, right? Uh, mm-hmm. So, Vox Akuma belongs to a company called Ninja Sanji, right? It's an agency, sure. basically. They develop these VTuber characters. They develop them. They all are basically under the same umbrella, and they all stream together occasionally. They, they get together. There's, there's different waves. They will usually announce, like, five new members at a time. Ninja Sanji, I think, is the second biggest one. I could be wrong about these details. There's a bigger one... Um, owned by a company called Clover. They, uh, they have two branches called Hollow Live and Hollow Stars, I believe. And they're different because the one is the female branch and one is the male branch. So, like, they have two different. Whereas Ninja Sanji, I think, is just kind of like they just mix them all together. There is no distinction between gender, at least as far as I've been able to tell. Um, mm. 
it's actually a bit controversial sometimes when the male streamers stream with the female streamers. <laughs> There's some very uh, <laughs> unchill people online that get upset about oh, that. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is where it's, this is the kind of weirder side of VTubers, which I've hinted at, but I don't think I've gone into, is that these are essentially, they're, they're manufactured people, right? Like, yeah, yeah. They are manufactured to be enjoyed by you. They're, they're manufactured to be your streamer that you enjoy. Uh, they, now that the people behind them, they, it's not like they have zero say, right? Like they often influence how the, the characters develop before they are presented. And, uh, they, and of course, eventually that person's personality, I think becomes dominant, right? Like ultimately they will drive what the VTuber is, but the VTuber model is owned by the company. It belongs to the company. So let's say if you are the person behind the VTuber and you are done, you want to stop for whatever reason, you know, you know, you're mm -hmm. tired, illness, um, mistreatment by a company. I'm not sure why that one might be relevant, but, uh, <laughs> and you decide to stop, uh, they have what's called a graduation ceremony. Sometimes, unless it's very abrupt, which does happen and might happen in the story I'm about to tell. Uh, mm. And uh, you, you, the character, I've mentioned this, that they, they, these people graduate, which means they stop doing their job. And then it's over. There is no more content from this VTuber. They can never come back. It just ends. And in some instances, all the videos get taken down. And all the social medias go private or are taken down. It's all gone. Mm. And, you know, let's say if this person stops and then like five years later is like, hey, maybe I want to reunite with the old gang. No, it's over. Once they're out, they're out. Um, and this can be if someone is, say, in a, in a strong parasocial relationship with a VTuber, um, can lead to some high emotions when there are graduations <laughs> as you maybe can understand um this is actually it's one of the things that like it's it it upsets me when i read about it because it just seems like a bad business model <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a lot of this is based on idol culture um in japan which has a similar thing where the idols will graduate and they will leave the company but those are real flesh and blood people and those people can go on to have, like, acting careers, right? Um, they can go on to do things. They just are no longer part of the idol group they were a part of, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, but in the VTuber world, it is a weird, it's an eerie thing where it's just like, it's just over. And it just stops. So when, it, when it, someone announces a graduation, it can get very uh, upsetting for people who are very involved in this world. Are you are you following me so far? Do you have any questions? Uh, anything I might? Um, no, no, I'm following you. I don't think I have any questions. Uh, I'm just very disturbed. Yes. By this, yeah. it feels like a, a real sense of autonomy is being stolen by these people, mm -hmm. or stolen from these people, even. Yeah. It does. Um. It, yeah, it's like they own your likeness. Like it's not actually your likeness, right? But they own... Yeah, but it's like the it's the closest thing mm. because they create this persona, this likeness yeah. for people to attach themselves to, and then when this company decides that's enough, your contract's over or or whatever have you, mm -hmm. then that's gone forever, and it is not the individuals; it is a corporation's. Yes, which is terrifying. And any work that you've done with your VTuber, because a lot of these VTubers they're not just they don't just stream video games; they also will make songs and stuff like that, or like do things, they'll do performances. That belongs to the corporation as well. Um, that and anything, like you, you can no longer, you can never sell merchandise of them again. You can never, now these people, now if you leave, you can go on and have a streaming career outside of it. You can even be a VTuber still. You just can't ever be that VTuber that you were ever again. And you cannot, mention the fact that you ever were that VTuber. That will violate the NDA you signed with the company. So, for example, let's say if I belonged to a company, I was a VTuber for a few years, I stopped, and then I, I picked up, I became... There are independent VTubers, too, I should mention. There are people who would just do it. 
They, they put the money in to buy all the equipment. They develop the stuff all on their own and they do it and they, they're completely independent. A lot of people that were former corporate VTubers tend to go the independent route afterwards. Um, let's say I do that. I can never mention directly that I was ever a former VTuber for this company. It's just, I have to come. And I think there's also stuff in place where I can no longer, I would no longer be allowed to stream with people that still belong to that company. That there can no longer be any crossover. That once you're out, you're out. Yeah, this is a real exciting way to start the season of yeah. the retrospective. I'm, I'm so, look, this is. I think this is gonna. I think you can see this. How this can be relevant, at least. No, a, a thousand percent. Yeah, so, and you're not wrong for bringing any of this up. This is what's happening in the world, and uh, you know, there's that. I don't remember who fucking. I'm sure a lot of people have said this, but it's like, why even tell like period piece movies anymore? And it's like, well, because a good period piece movie often touches upon stuff that is relevant today. It's like masking it to be like more acceptable to discuss yeah. now, in yeah. a way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's at the heart of what Babylon is about, and I, I think that's why you brought this up. It wasn't just your obsession with VTubers at the moment. Yes. Which is maybe the reason you brought this up, but not the sole reason. <laughs> it, 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 it's, I don't know, like, it's just because my eyes were looking there, right? Like that, like mm-hmm. I said, the only guy I follow is fucking Vox Akuma. Now, there was a moment recently where I was thinking, like, should I go deeper in on this? Like... Because a lot of the a lot of the VTuber culture is about like that they cross over with other people within the company a lot, or even sometimes they they will go outside of the company. They will they will stream with other companies um, from time to time. Um, there there's mm-hmm. there, there's there seems to be at least until recently, I will say there seems to be uh, a a good openness. There isn't there aren't like strict lines about like if you belong to one company you can't work with another. Like there, that doesn't seem to be as strict. Um, now sometimes the fans actually demand that sort of strictness, which is a whole other thing. But, uh, anyway, I mentioned that Box Akuma belongs to a company called Ninja Sanji, specifically Ninja Sanji EN, which is their English branch, because they have a Japanese branch as well. They had, uh, an Indonesian branch, and they had a Korean branch. Those are both gone now. That might be relevant later. Um, so... At the moment I started paying attention to Vox Akuma, uh, there had just been two graduations within the company fairly close to each other. And they were two fairly popular uh, members of uh, the company. And they, they, they're not the first. I believe they had a few. I'm not, I don't know everything about Ninja Sandy. I've been trying to read more, and I honestly read so much that it upset me, so I stopped reading. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no. <laughs> uh, so they had just lost two people, and these two both jumped ship to a different company, um, a company called v- v- Sojo, I believe is the name, um, and Shoujo. And, uh, they they've started they they now they have more autonomy over their viso shojo seems to have a mentality that's different than a lot of the others where if you want to leave um viso shojo uh you can take your character with you you can take the vtuber model with you so there are people in the past with v shojo who have left and they they haven't had to graduate and cut all that off they just no longer are a part of that company so that seems like a better business model in my opinion but <laughs> hey um, and since they have gotten there they have very casually let slip that they maybe didn't have the best time <laughs> at Ninja Sanji uh, they, they mentioned that they felt like they it, essentially what it came down to is they felt like they weren't taken care of by management as much it was very light stuff it wasn't a ton of things and they also, most of them immediately stopped, and they gave the reason for stopping is that they didn't want people still working there to get attacked, right? Because people mm-hmm. get very emotional about this stuff, as I have found out. Uh, but that started some whispers going on. Um, now, since December, I believe, uh, Ninja Sanji has lost four more people. 
four more there have been four more graduations and this apparently isn't common <laughs> The, the, hmm. the amount of graduations in such a short period of time is not common. One had been announced and had been in the works for a while. Um, two, one was announced shortly after Christmas, I believe, and was like basically like in two weeks they're going to be gone. And this was someone who had been there from the beginning and was extremely popular and was basically, there was almost like no warning this was going to happen. They were just one day, it was just announced, two weeks, they're gone. Um, immediately after that person graduated, another person announced, hey, I'm also graduating. I'll be gone in two weeks as well. And um, so some rumors have started to fly about what's going on over there. Uh, now, here's where it's going to get a little messy. Uh, oh, now it gets messy. Okay. Yes. I mean, look, like that sounds bad. It's not you. It's the, it's the story. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's worse. I guess is what I'm saying. So, oh. hold on. Let me. Oh, my fucking window okay. closed. One second. I had the thing, and then mm. I lost the thing, and then. Um, all right. All right. December twenty fifth last year, um, a VTuber belonging to Nishanji by the name of uh, Selene. I'm not as familiar. I, I I recognize the avatar. I've seen her a lot. I don't know her deal. I don't watch her stuff. But she's very popular, and she has a lot of crossover with the different companies. She seems to be uh, someone who brought a lot of the different companies together for like collaborations and stuff like that. Um, December 25th, she released a cover of a song like to her official campus. They produce songs and stuff like that, and a music video that went along with it. And I believe the song is owned by Ninja Sanji as well. It's made by a different VTuber within the company. Could be wrong by that, but I believe that's true. Um, it is posted on the 25th. Within like an hour of it being up, it is privated. And it's it's very strange that this happened. Uh, Slen makes this post where she says, hey, uh, let me, I actually have it right here. So, um, hello, I apologize, but management has privatized the song. Please feel free to re-upload it since a lot of money and effort was done um, by so many of my dragoons, which is the name of... you. Also, if you're a VTuber, you have to call your fans something. <laughs> so, like, her fans are called the dragoons. This is part of it. Um, I apologize. Uh, I'm really sad this happened on Christmas, but I hope somehow you guys will still be able to listen to it in some way. Now, it's very, like, this is just, it's very strange that that happened, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Two days later, she makes this announcement. Um, I apologize for the silence. I have been in the hospital after an accident and will be staying there for a few days um, to be under supervision. I just got back access to my phone yesterday. And then it's radio silence until Monday of this week. Um, I don't know if you if if you're reading between the lines too much in that last post, Diego. But uh, not having access to your phones, hospitalization after an accident. <laughs> um, if you're thinking it's bad, it is. Um, mm. Yeah. So. Out of nowhere, and this is in the middle of these two other graduations that happened. Out of nowhere, uh, Ninja Sanji Corporate released a statement that says Selene has uh, been terminated from the company. She's not even getting a graduation. She's been fired. All of her videos are taken down. Her Twitter is taken down immediately. Um, and they release a statement, a pretty long one, that um, says... Uh, Effective immediately due to repeated breaches of contract and misleading statements on social platforms. And they attached is detailed explanation um, for the decision. It's It's a lot of stuff about like not getting stuff commissioned correctly in terms of working with other artists, not getting approval for things, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of minor stuff, but mixed in there is the admission that she was hospitalized in a 
and I'm saying this just to be softer with it, for a self-harm attempt. That's how she ended up in the hospital. That um, she had attempted self-harm, and they admit this in this announcement, um, casually, very flippantly, I might say. Um, and that uh, that's why there's been this radio silence. And also mixed in there is uh, the fact that they're saying that we had a Terminator because she is threatening to make uh, defamatory statements as pertaining to abuse behind the scenes from management and other livers, which is their name for VTubers. Um, this is their announcement. This is, just comes out of nowhere. No one was given any warning for this. Uh, so, in, But in that statement, mixed in with all this other corporate fluff, is the admission that, one, she had attempted self-harm to the point where she ended up in the hospital, and two, that there had been accusations of harassment behind the scenes. And that it, they basically say in the statement that they fired the person making the accusations and give no clarification as to whether or not these claims were investigated, right? That's pretty bad. <clears throat> it's not looking good. It, it um, is not. I, it, this is like where I use them, like, Matt, we're on a segue. Like, we got to pivot back. I can't even stop that because no one's talking about this. I feel like you yeah. have to, like... Get this, this might, out there, because this is, like, horrific. Yeah, this might go mainstream by the time this episode airs, because it's, like, it kind of keeps ballooning. Um, now, uh, Selen... Now, here's something that's, uh... Where, uh, it's... It'll be difficult for me to talk about, because I don't know, actually, what I can say, because sh she has a separate account. She, she was a VTuber f before joining Ninja Sanji, um, and she left that independent VTuber job to join Ninja Sanji. She kind of reactivated this account for her independent VTuber. Um, and she releases a long statement that uh, basically is like, hey, yes, it's true. I was in the hospital for self-harm. I was given no warning that this termination was going to happen. I was trying to end things amicably. Um, I only reached out to a lawyer because I needed someone to run interference. And I didn't know if I had actually any grounds um, in terms of the harassment that was going on behind the scenes. So she basically confirms that harassment um, did happen. It's like, I was given no warning, given nothing, blah, blah, blah. Um, this, these two things back to back, right on top of each other, uh, everything just kind of explodes all at once. Um, and since then, there has been just, it's, but it's mainly been contained in the VTuber space, right? It hasn't gone mm -hmm. anywhere beyond that, but it's a large space and people have been freaking the fuck out about it. And it seems like if she wasn't given any heads up, neither were the other members of Ninja Sanji EN who had no statements prepared, had streams scheduled for today, the day of the announcement. And if it seems like she wasn't warned about her termination, the other members of Ninja Sanji EN weren't either because they had you know streams scheduled that day. Um, they had other stuff. They were they were kind of interacting normally because they were supposed they kind of interact together on social media as part of like building the brand. And they had they had sponsorships. They had other things going on. And a lot of them had to release announcements, being like, "Hey, I'm I'm going to take a break for a little bit. Um, no reason." <laughs> like, uh, and to be fair, like that's not me like dunking on them. They all have NDAs. It's very difficult for them to talk about. I don't even know what they're allowed to talk about. Right. Um, most made very generic statements uh, to that degree of just like, hey, I can't talk about this, like, or just like, hey, I'm taking a break. Um, yeah, like here, here's just a few, just to give some examples. Um, gonna take a couple days off, finish Accusa Four next week. Blah blah blah. Um, hey, I'm gonna be away from social media for a while, but um, I just want to remind you guys to please take care of yourselves. Um, might stream later tonight, but we'll see. It's another one. Um, sorry for the silence. I will be taking a small break from social media for a bit. Um, and just be there to support my friends when they needed like this afternoon. Oh yeah. And, uh, they all have, they all have canon birthdays, by the way. <laughs> so. Can, uh, oh, like for their personas? Yes. 
So when, you know, it's a big deal. So it's one of their birthdays. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. you got to celebrate. And then usually that means uh, new merch for the fans to buy, which is, I guess, which is probably the most important, important thing from a corporate standpoint. But also all their friends are supposed to come on the stream. Yay. And have and celebrate because it's a birthday party. Uh, it was someone's birthday on the day of this announcement. Uh, that poor <laughs> bastard um, who couldn't back out of it and still had to do it. So oh, a man. very, very tense birthday stream, I would like to imagine. Uh, here's some, some people are like, some people were more like open. Like they didn't say what was happening, but they admitted something was going on with like, um, saddened with everything going on. I'll take a few days off social media for my well-being. Take care, everyone. Um, um, hey, put, putting together a schedule right now. Near and Dark Souls seem like they won't work out this week. Um, but with some luck, they'll show up on the schedule next week. Here's hoping. Aside from that, um, I'll probably mix things up tonight. I'm going to need some time. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, one guy released like a genuinely long statement that I won't read. It's like a few paragraphs. But again, I don't think they mm-hmm. say they can say Selene's name at all in it. One wrote a very ominous, just, the truth will set you free. <laughs> Which... I don't know what the fuck that means. Um, uh, yeah, like a lot of them are very, there's a lot of very vague. One straight up said, here's, here's one that was more, um, I'll speak for myself, very unfair situation, I'm really upset, please be respectful. And someone asked how they were doing, and they said, I am not okay right now, but I will be. Please keep an open mind. Don't know what that means. Um, about keeping an open mind. Again, a lot of it is very vague. Um, some of these people, and then there's a lot of people that made no statements whatsoever, um, including my boy Vox Akuma, did not make a statement. Um, mm. Now, he has been on uh, vacation for the time, but he was still, he's been, you know, jumping in. He hasn't, he hasn't streamed on his own channel in a bit, I don't believe. I think he did a member stream, but I don't belong to the membership. Um, and... He uh, he's 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 been taking a break because we'll, we'll get more into the the Vox Akuma of it all in a minute. No oh, boy. Um, but he's been on a break. He's only been like hopping into other people's streams occasionally. Um, and but he but he was posting on his Twitter account up until basically the moment that the termination announcement came through. Um, so there's that. He has since come back. I will get to that later. Um. Now, uh, Selene, who is now back to her independent channel, uh, she did a stream, and um, I found that I found some bullet points that broke down basically what she talked about. Um, she, this, so here's just some bullet points. Um, she said she wants to move on completely after her statement. Did not know prior to Ninja Sanji announcement. Only found out about announcement of termination uh, when a friend sent her the tweets. So they didn't even let her know that it happened. Um, she tried to keep her side neutral, um, made a statement in advance with her lawyer in case she was terminated, which is the, which is what was put out, um, initially. Um, the statement posted was written by her lawyer and is safe by law. Never wanted public to know about the bullying drama. And that seems to be what she references when she speaks of harassment behind the scenes. It seems to be that there was some bullying of some nature. Uh, it is still unknown if that extends to the livers, the streamers, the VTubers themselves, or if it's just a management thing. It seems to indicate that some, someone, one of the other VTubers at least, might be culpable in all this. That they were that there was some sort of bullying behind the scenes. Um, at oh, le- shit. Yeah, at the very least, though, it doesn't seem like there was any, like, sexual harassment, which is what I was worried about when, like, the announcements first started coming. So, like, there's at least mm-hmm. that, but still. Um, not Luca, but she's like... Uh, so she said uh, she, she never wanted to go public about it. She can't legal, legally say anything more on the bullying issue. Um, confirmed she was in the hospital for a self-harm attempt. Um, sent Ninja Sanji her hospital notes and therapy notes. Um, which is a little sad. Um, Ninja Sanji knew about her situation, I think in return, in terms of the bullying, and disregarded it. Um, 
she wouldn't post without proof, as in like she wouldn't make these accusations. She's basically she has the receipts. She she hasn't given them, but she's given them to her lawyer to back up what she's saying. So she says she has proof that all this has happened, but hasn't posted the proof. Not that I'm saying she has to. I'm just just giving a statement as to where things are at. Um, she does not want anyone harassed or bullied. So she's like, don't go, don't be like looking for who's responsible for this at Ninja Sound. She says she wants to move on. Um, she's like, she wants to begin, you know, the year new. And she wants, she basically, she, she basically made a very diplomatic statement. She wants it all to be behind her, right? Um, mm-hmm. But that, of course, has not stopped the fans who have been desperately looking for who is responsible for this behind the scenes for the past week. And there have been wild, wild speculating going on trying to figure out who is responsible. I've basically seen no evidence pointing at anyone. Um, at one point, there were screenshots going around that were alleged to be leaked from a private Discord server for the Ninja Sanji members that has basically been confirmed to be completely fake. And that was the closest that came to anything substantial. Um so there's a lot of rumors flying around. This is Ninja Sanji basically did this to themselves because they did not have to release this statement. Um, so now they have the light. All the all the VTubers are in the crossfires because now all of them are suspect, right? And mm-hmm. it's it's very difficult to tell what the fuck is going on and what the fallout is going to be. This is an ongoing thing. Um, by the time I would not be shocked by the time uh, this episode airs, I'm I'm assuming. There, there's going to be announcements of other people graduating because it sounds like people are not happy behind the scenes. And I'm assuming you're going to want to get the fuck out of the company. Um, worst case scenario, the entire uh, English branch in Ninja Sanji could be shut down, which there is a precedent for because the Indonesian branch and Korean branches of Ninja Sanji were both, quote unquote, merged into the Japanese branch at a certain point. Um um, despite, from what I understand, this is, uh, I'm reading a lot of secondhand stuff, despite the Indonesian branch doing very well for itself, um, it was merged into the Japanese branch, and since then, the Indonesian, what was the in- Indonesian branch has lost 80% of the members that had belonged at its peak. Jesus. So, there's that. Um, yeah, uh, and since then, a lot of, like, there's been a lot of sponsorships drop other people have been vague tweeting about their relationship with Ninja Sanji and being like, I haven't had a good time with them. Um, in terms of Ninja Sanji, what, for what it looks like, Ninja Sanji trying to throw Selene under the bus in terms of commissions to artists that she hired. Um, it seems like... Uh, how do I phrase this? It seems like the artists are standing by her being like, hey, all my interactions with her were great. We didn't, like, she got, she paid us on time. It was Ninja Sanji that usually ended up being the problem. And so, because they can talk. They're not under NDAs. They're independent contractors. Uh, and, yeah, a lot of independent VTubers have been like, yeah, we, and Ninja Sanji, there's been rumors of problems there. Some of the former talents that I mentioned who have left and started at other companies have also been like, look, I can't say anything directly. I still have a lot of friends over there. But yes, there, I, I was aware of problems there, and it was part of the reason why I left. I didn't want to say too much because I knew. And it, a lot of it's been being like, look, there are problems over there, but we can't say anything. And because we can't say anything except for vague stuff, it gets a lot of innocent people being accused of stuff that didn't happen, right? So it's not, mm-hmm. it's not great. Um, another thing that came out, and this is, I think, a little more relevant to um, the movie we are here to discuss today... Uh, yeah, we'll get there. Oh, yeah. Um, Selene, in her new independent stream, um, revealed that uh, a lot of, at least from in her in her uh, experience, she paid for a lot of stuff like her music videos, like her projects, out of pocket. Ninja Sanji did not pay for them. Um, Selene, in the last year, uh, paid $200,000 out of pocket. For her own projects. Um, and if you're wondering how that relates to the amount of money she was making, she claims she did not make any money in the year 2023. So she she started the year and ended the year with basically the same amount of money. Uh, talent 
only gets 2% of the profit of official merch sales, which I did not know that. That's insane. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot going on over there. And now there's a lot... Of, also, uh, I should say, be, in order to figure out what the fuck was going on, I had to go down a lot of uh, different accounts that are in the VTuber space, and they oscillate between... Um, People who are sycophantic in love with certain people over at um, Ninja Sanji. Particularly, uh, Vox Akuma has a very strong fan base, I'll just say that. Um, uh, <laughs> who uh, they, they are very supportive of them. Um, and I also had to go down a lot of drama channels, which was one of the least pleasant things I've had to do. Um, from, what it's, from what I can tell, most of the drama channels seem to be wrong. So there's that. And something that made me trust, even though they were very sycophantic, they all seemed to be very critical of the company Ninja Sanji. Um, and also, the I, I texted this to you, Diego, something hysterical. Between all of like the, the hoopla and people freaking out about what's going on over there by VTubers, these posts being like, I can't believe they're doing this to them. This is awful. This is exploitative. In between posts like that, there will be posts like, Free Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> They're almost universally pro-Palestine. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> Which, to the point where, when there's been discussions about being like, people are like, we should boycott Ninja Sanji. And there's been a lot of debate about how to do it, because they want to find a way to do it where they can hurt the company, but not the VTubers, right? Yeah. Um, which I will have some more word on in a second. So, but, but then there's also been a debate on, don't use the word boycott, because we don't want to take space away from, the, from Israeli boycotts. Like, we don't want to take up too much space. Like, that's been an actual point of discussion. They're like, whatever we call it, we can't call it a boycott because we don't want to distract from the uh, boycott against Israeli products or, like, McDonald's and stuff like that that's been going on, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just a crazy element of this to me. Did not expect those two things to overlap. Um, so, yeah, things aren't great. Uh, there you go. No, they don't. They don't sound particularly uh, wonderful over there. No, um, and I I have a very limited understanding because, like I said, I only do follow you? one guy. <laughs> That's yeah, limited. Yeah, Th this is li look. What I'm leaving out so much, mainly because I don't understand it. <laughs> like they talk in words I don't understand, um, <laughs> and it's like. Like I said, there are so many accounts that, like, here's the thing, it's, it's a young people's game, right? This is Gen Z's game. Sure, like, sure, yeah, YouTubers. yeah. So, you gotta, so, remember what you were into when you were younger. Like, you were just into that, right? Because mm -hmm. you didn't have bills to pay. <laughs> like, you weren't, <laughs> you weren't thinking about your future. So, these people are only into VTubers. So, they only tweet about VTubers. So, there's, like, a whole inner language that I just can't decipher to some degree. Um, if you are, I hear something, this is something that I, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but it, it was thrown around a lot that, um, if you are a fan of a VTuber, that VTuber is your Oshi. You're supposed to refer to them as that. So in my instance, Vox Akuma would be my Oshi. Now I will never say that outside of this context uh -huh. because I still have some dignity left. God damn it! Okay, but I'm just trying to explain it. And this is how these people talk, and they're really into it, and they're really hyperbolic, and they're really intense. Um, so I just want to talk about what I have observed from um, the Vox Akuma perspective. Vox Akuma has not made any statement on what is going on. He was radio silent for a few days and then came back and just mainly posted about how he's been playing Tekken um, in his private time. And it seems to be just tweeting through it. He's tweeting like nothing is going on. That's not totally abnormal. There are plenty of VTubers who are not super active on social media. And uh, Vox Akim has made a point recent, in recent months of being like, I keep my private life and the, the sort of public you know, performance very separate. He seems to want to keep those two things separate. So whatever his opinions are, he appears to be keeping them to himself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, whether or not this is going to, we're going to see a mass resignation and a, and a mass graduation from Ninja Sanji Ian in response to this has yet to be seen. Who knows? The worm could entirely turn by the time this episode posts. Maybe 
ninja Sanji will pull something out of their ass that proves that they did nothing wrong i highly doubt that <laughs> but it's entirely possible um vox Akuma in the past has been very vocal about uh his uh his support of ninja sanji as a company and that his relationship with managers has been very positive um now i don't know what that means in terms of what he talks about in privacy with his friends um if his co-workers have ever let slip that hey maybe they aren't having as good exper- an experience as he is having and if they had let something slip um what his response was to those things um he's in an interesting boat because uh i don't know if i mentioned this on the show but uh vox Akuma has made a film yes he produced a film um starring himself it's canon to his persona i don't even have fucking time to unpack what that means <laughs> but it is canon it was self-financed though um he financed it himself and has basically not made money on, ba- back on it yet from what i understand and has been talking up that there will be a graphic novel version of the film he has produced released sometime in the future and that he will get the lion's share of the profits from that. He's made it very clear. He's like, hey, if you want to support me, buy that graphic novel. This is before everything kind of exploded, by the way. But he's kind of let it slip that he might be financially in the red and a little dependent on Ninja Sanji at this point. Mm. Um, so just throwing that out there. That that would um, change but... someone's tune. Yeah. Yes. To, to say not yes. even of their own, like, volition, you know? Yeah. Like... To where someone's loyalties might lie. Sorry, I burped in the middle of that. <laughs> of that. Um, but, uh, yeah, as to where his loyalties might lie or what his motivations are. Um, I cannot speak to him. Obviously, I do not know him. Um, but I, I just... Let's just say I have been concerned um, for a number of reasons. And I'm worried that by the time this episode comes out, he might be a canceled individual. All right, well. Um, there's, I've seen no evidence to that, that that will be the case. But I've also not seen anything to the contrary. There's a lot up in the air. Um, so it's complicated right now. But I also have been feeling... I Like, here's the thing. The more I've learned about this VTuber stuff, and the more I've heard him talk about his him liking that he wants to stay there, that he has... Because these talks about, like, this wave of graduations have been going on before everything has blown up. And he has had to release statements being like, look, I'm on break, but I have no intention of graduating. I love Ninja Sanji. I love being here. And he's made that very clear. And he's like... And he's also made it clear that he's had... He has big projects in the works. He seems to want to take his persona somewhere interesting. That's partly why I've been liking his content because we t- I talked about last time um, VTuber as a new art form and he seems to be someone who wants to try and push it in new directions, which is partly what I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that's the case, who knows what projects he's in the middle of when all this blew up and how willing he is to let that stuff go. Um, but let's just say that like worst case scenario isn't true and Vox Agama is just kind of caught in the middle of all this. Vox Agama, don't give this much of yourself to this company, man. Like this is this is a bad idea. Like what like, you know, I've seen this movie too many times, right? <laughs> like we like what the fuck? We've seen this story, right, Diego? Like Yeah. It's just he's giving so much of himself. He made a movie for them. And it's like he wrote it and produced it and edited it, and you know, that's it. It came from him. Ninja Sanji did not make that. And also, here's the thing: Ninja Sanji develops these characters. They also outsource the developing of these characters a lot of the time. Oh my like, god! Like it's not done in house. They pay people to develop these characters. I actually found a guy who's a VTuber himself, a guy named Merriweather, who's a fucking dog from like the <laughs> Netherlands. And, like, he writes, like, web comics, And, like, he, he'd been contracted by, like, several companies to write people's backstories. And then at a certain point was like, fuck it. I'll just start developing my own VTubers. And now he has his own VTuber company. Oh, my God. <laughs> because he was contracted so many times. Um, so, 
so I, it is something where like I'm looking at Ninja Sanji and being like, what do they do? Like other than this, they give a boost, right? They have a platform, right? They like you can go from being someone who had an audience like. Also, another thing in in reading up on all this trauma, I found out a lot of uh, these VTubers' other accounts, their real life accounts, and I found out what a lot of these VTubers look like in real life. Um, and uh, just for a more comical thing, they couldn't look less like their avatars. <laughs> like it's which I you know I guess that makes sense, but I'm I was just a little shocked. Be like. I thought they would at least make there would be some attempt to make them look similar, <laughs> but there isn't. They look nothing like their avatars, so I just found that kind of amusing. Um, but I'm kind of like, what does Ninja Sanji do other than exploit people, other than foster what appears to be a uh, toxic environment behind the scenes, and take a lot of your money? Yeah, like it's. It's something where, I mean, like I said, like we've seen this movie before, just as one example, fucking the comic book industry. The people who built that industry, the people who made the characters that they now make billion dollar movies out of, at least until last year. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no more of that. <laughs> see, that seems to be done. But a lot of those fucking guys got nothing. Mm -hmm. they, the they, fucking they creator of Rocket Tom. Raccoon um, had yeah. to start a GoFundMe. Yeah. Rocket it's Raccoon. up. He's like, yeah. no, honestly, like this isn't just me fanboying out because of Guardians. Like, I would say that's one of the more popular comic book characters now, because of those yeah. fucking movies. Exactly. And he had to and start a GoFundMe. Like, I'm, that's fucked up. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like, read about the comic book industry. It is such a nightmare. It's so awful what they did to these people. And it's one of those where, like, that's one of those industries where I'm kind of like, don't go into it. Like, yeah. well, if you're going to do it, only be independent. And I understand that's a hard road, but mm -hmm. only be independent. I'm st and I kind of feel similarly about VTubers, right? Yeah. I'm at this point where I'm like, don't become part of these companies. Now, I, I, I only really know Ninja Sanji and this other one. From what I understand, this the other one that does the Hollow Live and Hollow Stars company, from what I understand, they're a little bit better. But I don't know the details. And because everyone's under NDAs, it's hard to tell exactly what's going on there. I'll say this, um, Hollow Life, Hollow Stars has had a lot less graduations in the last year <laughs> than, um, and, and they, I, I would say, I, I think if I look at it, Hollow Life has had, Hollow Life, Hollow Stars on the English side has had less graduations in three years than Ninja Sanji has in the last four months. You want to if you want to see the difference that's going on there. Mm. So, um, but like again, it's still like I'm still kind of like. But when you're done, you don't own any of this. Like you don't take any of it with you. And there are some more companies, like I said, um, V Shoujo, which is more flexible, um, which seems to be a lot more autonomous about that sort of thing. Um, so I'm like, there's at least that. Um, and like I said, I also think it's a bad business model because it makes these companies look bad every time there's a graduation, right? Because it starts spreading rumors about why is this happening. And then it's like, I was thinking about, you know, like when Conan O'Brien left The Tonight Show, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't like NBC took Conan O'Brien out back and then shot him in the head to release him from his flesh prison. <laughs> like, it, it was like, it was like, no, Conan was off the air for six months and then he had a new show, right? Mm -hmm. And and I say this to someone who's like, as, like I've become a fan of Vox Akuma, Vox Union, yes, Akuma. <laughs> And if he is, if he is to graduate as a result of what's been going on, it will be sad. But I want it to happen at this point because I want him to get the fuck out of there. I don't want him to give all of himself away. Like I, I would rather him start from scratch with an independent thing and funnel all his creative creative energies into that. You know? Yeah. Like he's yeah. clearly got a drive. He's got an audience. He could totally do it. I'd rather him get the fuck out. And. It's just, it's crazy how these, I mean, it, you know, it kind of, remember when, like, when Channel Awesome, like, finally imploded yeah. a few years ago? Like, it feels very similar to that. Where it, it's sort of it's like the, of, like, it's the, the staple, it's like the bar or the barometer for, like, oh, that's what this, like, subculture, that's what this industry is about. These are the faces of it. And then you realize, yeah. like, hey, this is, like, there there's some weird shit happening here. Um... 
And some people wash their hands clean of it, and some people cop to it and even do better afterwards. Like, I, I want to shout out, you brought up Channel Awesome, like, not like, a, not like a perfect internet celebrity or anything like that, but like Chris Stuckman, you know, he's like, he, he moved away from that, and I, I think whenever I see his stuff come across my feed now, it's like, the most interesting he's ever been, and I don't even regularly watch his stuff anymore. Like, you can do better, <laughs> <That's>, you know? <laughs> that's something funny about, just to talk about Channel Awesome for a second, that's something funny about them where I feel like everyone who has left, and everyone who was, like has left Channel Awesome, like even before the drama, has either gotten funnier or gotten better in terms of the content they made. <laughs> yeah. Like, anyone that is still doing it. Like, fucking, like, I, I think I told this to you, and most people maybe don't know this, Dan Olson, who did the uh, the big, like, Line Goes Up NFT video that went viral a few years ago, and has done similar videos, mostly about finance since then, started at Channel Awesome. Yeah, and like, I had no idea until you told me. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, kind of a controversial figure, but, like, the nostalgia chick, Lindsay Ellis. Mm-hmm. Who is still out there, not on YouTube, but she's still making content behind the scenes at another company. But um, say what you will about her as a personality, I believe her content got better the moment she left Channel Awesome, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. All her I analytical think. stuff was was really great. Like, you know, definitely a, a, a white woman online who maybe should have yes thought she's more had about some moments where what she they were posting. Yeah, definitely. Um, she should have stepped away from the Twitter. Yes, um, but but yeah, her videos um, like they just kept getting better. Like. They yeah. they really did until you know the last YouTube one, but like besides that, yeah, you're totally right. <laughs> yeah, like I, I think everyone got better when they left. Um, and in another another sad thing that I saw a parallel for is that because I told you there's some people that like really love these VTubers, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean like really love them. Where uh, like I said Vox hasn't been stre- I mean um, yeah Vox hasn't been streaming himself. But he has been going on other streams, and there was recently I, I haven't watched it because I don't really watch the collab stuff, um, especially right now, um, with where my feelings are with the whole industry and the fact that there might be a piece of shit behind the scenes at Ninja Sanji, um, and it could be anyone. Um, they did a big collab with a lot of all the male, like like it was like eight of the male VTubers all did like a collab together on Friday, and I saw a bunch of people posting about it being like, it's just good to hear them laughing together again. Right, and I saw a post being like, "Look, if they leave, I'll be happy for them because like they should get out of there. It'll make me sad, but I'll be happy for them and stuff like that." And it reminded me of this really dark moment that happened when Channel Awesome was falling apart. I don't know if you remember this, but when Channel Awesome was falling apart, before they made any response, like another Nostalgia Critic video went up, and I'm just kind of like a generic like Nostalgia Critic review, and I saw all these comments under that video that were like. These are banked episodes. Um, I can't. Mike Majo, I think, is the guy who owns uh, Channel Awesome, who owns the Nostalgia Critic brand and stuff like that. Um, people like Mike is unloading the backlog because Doug Walker is going to announce he's leaving any day now. Because <laughs> Doug Walker would not stand for this kind of stuff, right? And it's like Doug wow. Walker will do the right thing. And it was like so soul crushing, right? Mm-hmm. Like. Because, look, it's kids writing that, right? Yeah. Like, it's kids who they think Doug Walker is a better person than he is. And I just, I saw some parallels with the sort of sycophant nature of VTuber fans that really bummed me the fuck out. Like, it made me really upset. And some of it was in response to there are people, you know, there are obviously haters of this kind of stuff, and they kind of swoop in. To be like, uh, you know, to kind of just like balance things out where there are people who are just like, they want to ruin everyone's lives. And there have been harassments against, there's been a lot of harassments targeted at any Ninja Sanji member that has expressed that they've had a good relationship with management. Um, there was There's one unfortunate um, woman, I think her name is Millie, who in the midst of these rumors about Ninja Sanji, be, not Ninja Sanji being a bad company, made a, made a statement where she was like, Look, people should stop doing that. I've had a great experience here. People who talk about this stuff don't know what they're talking about. And now that it has come out that Ninja Sanji is definitely a bad company, uh, that has reflected badly on her, and people have singled her out as possibly being one of the bullies behind the scenes, even though there's no evidence. All she did was speak positively of the company she works for, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not saying there's nothing there, but I'm saying we, we don't, no one knows anything. 
So it's led to a lot. And this is Ninja Sandy's fault. They did not have to make that statement. They put all their 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 employees at risk with this stuff. And they've basically made no official statement since then. They've even been like, hey, more merch coming. And people being like, the fuck? We're not buying anything. Like, <laughs> like people, people are like, we're not buying any more shit. And people have been pirating stuff that is behind paywalls being like, if you like them and still want to watch it, like, here's how to pirate it. And, and subscriber numbers have gone down. People have dropped by, like, huge numbers. Um, it's been bad, and it's mostly affected the streamers who, for all we know, have done nothing wrong, right? It could just mm-hmm. be entirely management's fault. Um, it's bad to see. It's, it's again, like I said, we've seen this story before. And we've seen how uh, these industries can kind of become these, like, weird corporate things that just exploit the labor of people beneath them. Um, so anyway, Babylon. <laughs> Damien Chazelle's Babylon. Released in 2022, starring Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Diego Calva. It's technically about the transition of the silent era of film into sound. Um, it's also about capitalism and the the rambunctious nature of artists and how it was like all the all the positives and negatives you hear about like making movies. Like it, it's it's trying to be. I'm going to quote film critic Katie Walsh's review. Actually, I'm not even going to say the line. I'm going to quote a paragraph right now, okay? Okay. Damien Chazelle would really like to talk to you about Singing in the Rain. Of course, you already know the 1952 Stanley Donen MGM meta musical comedy starring Gene Kelly and Debbie Reynolds about the transition from silent to sound films. But if not, Chazelle will recount it for you. At great length, and with more bodily fluids... In his three-hour-plus Hollywood history lecture, Babylon, which waffles between being a love letter to cinema and a suicide note. Mm-hmm. End quote. That's how she opens her review. I think she's a really yeah, talented I, critic, but that was like I, that's I, a banger. That that was I remember reading that one. I actually remember reading that one because I remember the suicide note. Um, yeah, that yeah. one got a lot of play because so, a lot of people didn't like um, this movie when it came out. Yeah, and then a lot um, of people did. Yeah. First of all, I already I already wanted to shoot you with your opening statement. By the way, why I think um, it is about those things. We look film Twitter. We need to pump the brakes on what we say a movie when we say a movie is about capitalism, because uh, we, we've lived under globalism for about like a century now. Uh, everything is about capitalism because that's the world we live in. Like. It's we we have to be a little smarter about what we talk about in terms of what we say when we say something is about capitalism. Jaws is about capitalism. Like that's not an untrue statement. Well, I guess I got to get more specific. Like, did I ever tell you my take on what the lighthouse is about? Um, you've you've mentioned you've mentioned the sort of like capitalist read on it. Before. Yeah, it, it's about the gig right. economy. Yeah, to me that's that movie's about about the gig economy. I mean, that's not a bad take. (laughs) Thank you. Um, That's 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 a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, But lighthouse uh, failed award contender. I don't know what the lighthouse would be. Um, I mean, that was kind of one where everyone was like, "Well, they should get uh, they should get acting noms," and then they didn't get any. Yeah, they didn't get shit. Maybe actually, they got nominated for cinematography, but they lost to Deacons, which makes sense (laughs) if you're gonna lose to anybody. Well, which which Deacons? Uh, 1917. I mean, look, I love Deacons, but... (laughs) I like that movie, Uh, and I like his work in it. 1917. um, A movie that exists. Do you like it more than Babylon? Um, It's shorter, for one thing. (laughs) What is your take on Babylon? Because you were the first person to bring it up on this podcast a, a while back. Because I really? did not watch it until later. I remember this vividly because it was such a divisive movie upon release. I was like, there's got to be something here. and Because mm-hmm. I, I like all of Damien Chazelle's other movies. I'm, I'm not worshipping at his altar. But uh-huh. I, I like his stuff. I really like the cinematographer, Linus Sandgren. Um, uh, I like all the actors. People started turning on Margot Robbie at this point in her career a little bit. And I was like, Why? Um, and I think it's just um, we hate women in this world. But 
Uh, you are touching a fucking third rail right now. I, with, I'm all over uh, the place, but with uh, fucking with just what just happened with the Oscar nominations. Uh, oh, yeah. pe- people are very chill about that. Oh, people are so uh, cool and normal about that. All that. Well, 20, 2022 is uh, Babylon. Or two movies that year are Babylon and Amsterdam. Oh, which fuck. Are two, like, Babylon is better choices. than Amsterdam. I couldn't finish Amsterdam. Yeah. Well, fucking dog shit is better than Amsterdam. Yeah. Well, I was trying to do this whole thing, like this whole big piece about like that movie and its horrible, awful, evil director person. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was like, you know what? It's just better not to give this oxygen. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, um, but, but I was, I, I mentioned, I, I made a joke before Barbie came out, um, because actually I probably made it right when Babylon had just dropped that I was like, Margot Robbie's entire career is now riding on Barbie <laughs> <laughs> because she had kind of gone from, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood and fucking like Wolf of Wall Street, like Wolf of Wall Street to then she is Harley <laughs> Quinn. Then I Tanya. Sorry, right when you said her whole career is riding on Babylon an earthquake just happened oh my I god not even fucking joking well sorry Margo no. she's gonna be fine she's gonna be fine um I, I remain a big fan and I have no negative feelings no, no, about yeah, her yeah. Uh, but it was just, was it was just this crazy. weird thing it was just it was just this weird thing of like she was suddenly like she was it for a minute right like she was yeah. suddenly all over the place she she had a Tarantino movie lineup. She was Harley Quinn, and then by the time Barbie comes out, it feels like a lot of that potential had kind of disappeared, right? Because like mm-hmm. the fucking Harley Quinn stuff's gone. Like they, they tried t- two more times with Birds of Prey and the Suicide Squad, didn't work out. She was in Bombshell, didn't work out. Um, yeah, like I said, Amsterdam, Babylon, or two are like kind of awards pushes, didn't work out at all. She's also a producer on Promising Young Woman. Um, and on Saltburn, by the way, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, I feel like that got her a lot of uh, negative. You know, um, some people in film Twitter maybe don't like that because they don't like that movie. Um, and it's kind of like Barbie has kind of been like a, an interesting kind of rebound for. Her. I feel like if Barbie had like been a disaster, we Margot Robbie might have been done in a weird way. Even though I feel like she's done a lot of good work, and I have become a fan of hers. Um, yeah, and I. I, I, th- I think she's a really underrated actress at this point, which is strange to say because she is, like, she's so prominent and everyone kind of knows her now. And, like, yeah. she's obviously very traditional, like, like beautiful. Like, she, she's uh, obviously a very stunning screen presence. Um, So maybe she doesn't even need defense. Maybe it's just we're too online and we see the negative side of this. Um, yeah. But I think she's also such a smart, like, producer and, like, collaborator because when she made that statement about, like, I don't want people to get sick of me. I might take some time away, like from doing too many projects or whatever. I think she's really got her finger on the pulse. No, she uh, does. She actually she seems very smart. Like she kind of, like by all accounts, she kind of took over behind the scenes with Birds of Prey, and like she picked a good team to work on that. We're both big mm-hmm. defenders of that movie. Um, mm-hmm. That movie should have been called the Harley Quinn movie, but hey, yeah, um, yeah. It, it not just because of what the movie is, but it would have done better at the box office. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, she seems to be a smart person and I mean, hell, hell, Brad Pitt also similar rise in his career. I mean, he's a producer. He's got like plan B and Mm -hmm, shit like mm -hmm. that. Uh, he's about to have a very different fall and that's all we'll say on that. Yeah. yeah, What are you going to do? Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, he's, he's had an interesting career, but he also, he was, he's also was very smart in who he chose to work with and how he built his career, right? Like, he became yeah. Brad Pitt for a reason and showed similar smarts to Margot Robbie. So it's interesting that two smart people would pick a movie like this. Aww. Uh, um, okay, I'm, so I just praised Margot Robbie. Um, and I'm going to always praise her, unless she does something horrific, obviously. But as an actress, as a creative, I think this is her worst performance by like a country mile. Everyone's bad in this movie. I can't even single her out. No, there no, but like here's the thing cuz I I didn't think she was capable of being bad. It's sort of like when I saw Mank, you know? Mank, Mank. Mm-hmm. Um David Fincher, I I, I was kind of like I had this splash of cold water to my face where I was like, "Oh, he's like not he's not technically perfect here." Like whatever his other movies like like flaws and successes, like he's all oh, Fincher, he makes like a technically perfect film. 
whatever, right? Like, whatever that means to people, like, I think there's not really anything wrong with his technical execution. And I was very shocked by Mank. With Babylon, I was like, oh, Margot Robbie's, like, all over the place in this. And everyone else is all over the place in this. So, yeah. Yeah. Not just her. Again, it was just shocking for me to see me not vibe with one of her performances. Um, And I I I was like, how did this happen? (laughs) I think this comes down to the director, frankly. Um, Seems to be the common denominator with between a lot of the problems this movie seems to have. Um, yeah. yeah, Babylon's a bad movie. Um, yes, Diego mentioned that like I, I was the first to bring it up on this podcast. Um, for some, for some of you may know that I have defended the movie The Whale in the past. Uh, and part of it is, I swear to God, I think part of the reason why I responded positively to The Whale, and maybe we'll discuss that movie on a later podcast, who fucking knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But part of it is that I saw Babylon and the Whale on the same day, and I left Babylon with over an hour to go to catch an earlier screening of the Whale, so I didn't have to wait an hour between movies. And going from Babylon to the Whale made the Whale look like a much better movie. That's so fucking so, crazy. So I think that's partly why I was so positive on that one. I also a I movie I still have watching. not seen, by the way. Yeah, it, it's a movie. We'll talk. We, one day we will talk about it. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I didn't finish Babylon first go-around. I kind of responded really negatively to it. Um, and then I finally was like, you know what? Whatever, I'll give it a second chance. And then on the second go-around, um, turned out I actually liked it even less. Uh, so, <laughs> once I saw the full picture of Babylon, I actually liked the movie less. Mm. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people really hyped up, like, oh, this is so crazy, man, you gotta see, they're doing all this crazy shit with the camera, and oh, man, there's so much debauchery, and it's like, here's the thing, technically, I guess there's some stuff on display that's a little hectic, um, I think I'm not a fan of how Damien Chazelle tends to, like, use the camera, like, it's very often, like, it's never really still, and if it is, there's some crazy whip pans happening at some point, right? Um, but there's also, like, like the actual, like, party stuff on display. Like, it's not, like, that shocking or thrilling. Um, it's not, like, evoking anything other than, like, it's, it's trying to make you feel like this, you're getting caught up in the whirlwind of, like, this artistic debauchery that these people are, like, participating in. But then I'm watching it and I'm like, why am I? I don't feel anything. Yeah, I, 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 feel I have a similar thing. Where like, nothing <laughs> watching yeah, this happen. This movie should evoke more emotions than it does, and instead I mostly feel bored. Right? Yeah. Like, and like that. I, I honestly, I struggle to pinpoint exactly why that is. Um, I want to talk because I want to talk about like the opening of this movie. Is like. It works for, like, five minutes, in my opinion. Okay. Um, I think the the moving of the elephant in the in the opening five minutes of this movie, it, it kind of gets the whole idea of the film right there, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's this insane, outlandish thing. Um, and you see how Hollywood, just the proof of being, like, even, like, close to the flame of Hollywood is enough to bribe people, right? Like, it's not just money. It's, like, you get to come to the party as well. It's how, like, all this stuff is becoming transactional in nature, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's all right there, and it's not... They're not just bribing the guy bringing the elephant. They're also bribing, you know, the police and shit like that. And then, of course, the elephant shits directly into the camera. <laughs> so the movie is like, directly taking a shit on the audience. Is That's exactly what's happening there. And it's like, for five minutes, the movie works. Where you're like, I get it. I get what the movie's going for. And then, like, literally the movie's like, then the music was like, one, two, three, hey! <laughs> and we're supposed to cut to something crazy. And that crazy thing is Fatty Arbuckle Piss Play. <laughs> which happens in this movie. For anyone who hasn't seen, I don't think it's it, it's not explicitly Fatty Arbuckle, but it's supposed to be Fatty Arbuckle. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and it just all immediately dies. Right? Like... Yeah. She's she's taking a piss on him, calling him a little piggy, and I feel nothing, not even disgust. Like, what the fuck happened? Why is it that abrupt? Like, I, I can't tell you. Um, it just, it like died for me immediately and it like never really got it back. There's, there's two subsequent scenes that I enjoyed in this movie that are like full length scenes that aren't just like shots. And, but like, man, it just dies so hard. And I think it's because the way he uses the camera is that what he draws attention to the most with the camera is not anything happening on screen, but the camera itself. Maybe I'm like wrong in how I'm saying this, but it feels like that's where maximum attention is placed. No, with the I camera. I didn't think about that. I have a different take. We I can save that for later because it's involved other stuff, but I never thought about it that way. I think you're right. Yeah. I think he is the true star of his own film for better and worse. And I think it's worked yeah, other I, times. And I don't think it works at all here. Yeah, I didn't want to go that far with it and be like, he's it's some it's him trying to show off himself, right? It's like yeah, no, to me that's not even a matter. negative inherently. I think it's a negative for yeah. this movie, but mm-hmm. it, I'm I'm like pro that. Like some people are like, oh, I don't want directors to show off. Like I don't know. I watch a fucking like a modern movie, a modern comedy, and it's just like stilted camera placements and. Like people riffing for five minutes on screen, the camera's just completely yeah. still. I I like a little show off, okay? I you don't think it be works a here. Fan, you can't be a fan of Francis Ford Coppola's work and claim you don't like ego. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can't. You can't. It, that's a, that's impossible to do. So yes, I, I I am in agreement. Like it's not. It has nothing to do with like if he was doing a better job, I would be less upset about it. But just doesn't work and yeah it's hard for me to totally pinpoint it you know like Mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of that with what you're saying um but yeah and then we have to talk about the movies that it's so clearly evoking i mean it's you know it's obvious but he's he's trying to do wolf of wall street he's trying to do boogie nights right Mm -hmm. And and the singing in the rain comparison comes up a lot and then it yeah. tries to end like Cinema Paradiso. <laughs> yeah, we will talk about that ending because I think it has an unintentional different meaning. Um, I agree. I, I think I know where you're going to go with it. We're going to save that. We, we're not going to break down this entire three hour long movie because, frankly, it's just not yeah. that interesting. But I there's think there's plenty to talk about regardless. Yeah. Um, but how do I say this? Like, not to be like the fucking magic of cinema, right? Like, not to uh-huh. be like, it's like, like that's also, all right. Here's one thing just to get it out of the way. I'll come back to this, but like, just to get it out of the way, is this movie a satire? Uh, I don't think, I, I don't think, I'm sure Damien Chazelle's a fine fellow. I don't think he, he is interested in satirizing mm-hmm. anything in his art. Cause thus I far. can. I can come away with no other reading than this movie is a satire and that Manny is essentially a moronic monster. <laughs> <laughs> and that the movie's a joke on him, a la Showgirls. That's the only reading I can see of this movie that is any in any way positive. <laughs> And I, but I haven't heard that take anywhere. And I don't know if it's like glaringly obvious and that's why no one is saying it. Or if I'm just wrong. Like You, I don't know. I I don't know. I actually don't know. But someone else had a similar take, not to this movie, but to actually La La Land. Mm. Where, ah, God, I have to find the, I'm going to link this review when I find it. But the, 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 the poster, um, she wrote. She's the one who wrote the like the epic fucking thesis on Bad Boys Two on Letterbox. If you know Bad Boys Two and you know Letterbox, you know exactly the one I'm talking about. Mm. She said like I, I don't care what anyone else tells me about La La Land. It's about falling in love with the first idiot you meet, uh, like when you're younger. 
Mm-hmm. And I I kind of think La La Land works better that way, too. And I like that movie. <laughs> Where mm-hmm. it's like Ryan Gosling is just like this pretentious idiot um, who's like, he's trying to be like prestigious as possible. And uh, in hindsight, I think Damien Chazelle is that. Uh, not an idiot. Yeah, well, that's. But like, I think he relates more to that aspiration than anything that could be like more more um, vulnerable. I guess. Well, that's that's where we have to talk about Damien because it's like he he I I am still a big fan of Whiplash, and but it's this weird thing where like he bursts onto the screen with Whiplash with like a fully formed voice. In my opinion, he feels like this guy knows what he's doing. He can make a movie. And I don't think that I don't think he has shown that he can't make a movie, but it feels like since then two things he has tried to imitate other people's styles with his subsequent films, and has gotten away from his own voice. And I think that has had a detrimental effect on his career. And I think he's only gotten worse as a director in terms of like being interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. I think Whiplash is still his best movie. I I like La La Land okay. I didn't like First Man, and I kind of hate Babylon. <laughs> like <laughs> it's been a weird spiral downwards, and I almost feel like he, there was a mistake in giving him any sort of awards traction with Whiplash. Like I feel like I, I, honestly, I feel like it's oddly similar to where M Night was post Six Sense, where he can't decide if he's a genre director or a prestige director, right? Mm, mm-hmm. And it feels like. Uh, he M Knight has now settled on that he is a genre director, and I think that has worked out much better for him as a result. You know, yeah. Uh, and he's not ch- he's not chasing. He's not trying to scare the audience and also get nominated for a bunch of Oscars <laughs> anymore. Um, and then the other thing is that like the further away from Whiplash you get, you start going. Does he agree with the the thesis of this movie? <laughs> like, yeah, because a lot of his movies are about like the thing you love has to destroy you, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. Like that that's that y- y- in order to be great, in order to be truly great, you have to let the thing destroy you. And Brad Pitt's character in this movie, rather than just being a lesser version of himself, fucking commits suicide. Yeah. <laughs> like. As if, like, that's the worst fate someone could have, mm-hmm. is not being able to achieve true greatness. Yeah, and I, I think, had we not seen his other movies, I don't know if I would have that reading of that character. I'd see well, that no, as a yeah. tragedy, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, it's weird where it's like, I because th- I feel like Whiplash, I've always viewed Whiplash as a, I mean, it's produced by Jason Blum, I've always viewed Whiplash as a monster movie. Yeah. Where fucking J.K. Simmons is Dr. Frankenstein, and Miles <laughs> Teller is his creation. Like, and it's a fucked up movie where, like, and it feels like the movie kind of gets it because uh, at the end of the movie, Fletcher takes credit for Miles Teller. Like, he, mm-hmm. he's the one who bows at the end after breaking this kid and making him give this performance. And so it felt like Whiplash got that. But then, like, every subsequent film in, in um, conversation with each other. It's like, I feel like these films will be better on their own, but in uh, conversation with each other, they're actually, it, it, it's concerning almost, right? <laughs> like, it, it, it presents a weird philosophy to these movies. Yeah, it, it's, I don't know, I think he's, his characters, uh, and we'll talk about characters in a second too, because I, I, I think they're very thin in this movie. I, th- I don't think they're real characters. I think they're sort of like they, mouthpieces mm-hmm for his ideas on this era of film and film in general and the sacrifices people make for it. But I do think he likes them to have a sense of like self martyrdom Like they're giving themselves to something greater and they have to sacrifice for that. And I don't know if I agree with that in any aspect of life. Yeah. This is, this one's kind of interesting in that regard because it does kind of get into the exploitative nature of it, right? Where it's like, it's about yeah. how, like, the labor of it all. Like, he kind of gets into that. Not enough, if you ask me, but uh, that's kind of what part of this movie is. Um, but at the same time, yes, the characters are very thin. I call them Pixar-level characters, oh. where you know exactly what their arc is going to be the moment they appear on screen, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you know exactly where everyone's story of the of the main three. You know exactly where their story ends, yeah. right? Like, and oh, that, actually, you know that's what? That's not bad. That's not bad if you're a Pixar film, <laughs> and it's just children, 
right? Like, yeah, I, I want to say gotta this, start this, somewhere. Yeah, the, this character is still very thinly written, but I want to shout out the actor Jovan Adepo. He was the lead in the super underrated Overlord. Like, yes, I don't know if you well, no, saw no. that. He's not included. I'm talking about the three main leads. Okay, okay. Cause... I just wanted to shout him out because I said everyone's like career worst performance, and that's like not true. Uh, I think it's true for Robbie, but she's got very high career highs. Um, but mm. Jovan Adepo, I thought was really good, and it's like that material is maybe like really compelling on the page if you're first reading it and then you just realize there's not enough character there well, for that to hit anything other than like hey you're kind of also just exploiting a black actor yeah yeah in a story about exploitation well, that's, that's the thing where it's like is the movie in on it because it is some because there is a commentary about marginalized voices being sidelined for you know white leads yeah and that's exactly what happens in the uh-huh. movie I mean, um, like, him, Lee Ju Lee, and Gene Smart, I think, are three of the more interesting characters in the movie. And they're, like, they're, like, bit players. Yeah. Like, it's like, it's like the movie should have been about them. And I can't tell if that's intentional or not. That's why I'm partly like, is this a satire? Like, is he, is he making a joke about the industry? Now, I'm not saying it's a good joke. It's kind of a joke we've heard one too many times. Yeah. But it feels like... That's what he's going for at times. That this movie's a satire on the industry and the nature of it, and the and these type of stories. Like it almost feels like a fuck you to singing in the rain at the end, right? Like, yeah. Um, um, also, but... shout out to to Lee Jun Lee, who again I also wish had way more to do yeah. here. Um, she's it's underserviced basically... by the writing. Like, yeah. Um, but she, she's basically an, an analog for Anna Mae Wong, who uh, is kind of the first Chinese American like movie star, like in yeah in America. In as um, much and as much as Asian Americans were allowed to be in that era, like yeah, yeah. Uh, and something I'm glad that this movie did have people talking about was that look, like it's never been perfect in any industry of filmmaking, specifically Hollywood. Um, but it, it was much more diverse at the time because yeah. it was just a bunch of carny freaks and shit like that. Like, th- yeah. that it brought awareness to that, I am thankful for. And I hope we keep talking about that because that is important to be like, hey, look, 100 years later, not it looks like it's gotten worse in terms of representation, which is psychotic yeah. to say. In this industry, in these facets specifically, obviously so much else has improved and there's still well, so many other avenues we have to improve upon. But one of the that one of the smart things this movie does hit on, which it makes me wish the movie was better, is that part of it is about the shifting power from star personality to the studios, right? Right. That like the, like it's like to focus on the sound of it all of being like, oh, like some people couldn't do sound because their voice was weird, which is kind of what Singing in the Rain is about, right? Is to mm-hmm. focus on that is to kind of miss the point. Because what really shifted was it went from, right, like you said, these carny freaks, these people just running out in the middle of nowhere and just being like, run at each other and attack and like do all this crazy shit. It went from that to now we're on studios. The studio is owned by someone. The person who owns it owns everything from the top down. And like Li Jun Lee is, she isn't just forced out like she is because she's a marginalized voice. She's a lesbian. Like there's all, like that's an angle to it. But the other thing they throw in there is that like, hey, you did title cards. We don't need those anymore. And those sort of, like, little jobs, which, you know, you can be like, hey, you don't need to do that job anymore. Isn't that great? Losing a job like that is costing, you know, a person, like, an in in the industry. And that often affects the people lower on the totem pole who are the more marginalized voices who they can't afford to support themselves with their straight career. Like, she's a singer, but she's also still working for her family. And she's also doing the titling on movies and some editing. And... She's basically supporting herself with doing all these like little jobs and that as those little jobs fall away, she can no longer afford to stay in the industry. Same for the black musicians who, you know, like they can also be at parties and also do the music for the movies and also the music on set and stuff like that. And as they're slowly, as those jobs are slowly eliminated, it defers to the power structures already in place, which are white hetero voices and the reason why that's relevant today is because we are seeing that right now with how the studios have shifted to more, you know, the streaming model, the the constant blue screen, green screen, filmmaking model. And now with AI, 
which is set to cut a lot of people's jobs out. At least that's the goal. And it, it the people that are always going to get hurt are the marginalized, even if you don't intend that. Because those are the people that they, they take the entry-level jobs that allow them in, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the more interesting things in this movie. And uh, even now further I, than just that, too, like uh, the, the, per, like the PA, the PA pipeline to like other avenues and departments. Yeah. Um, like it's there, but it's not what it used to be uh, for writers. Writing assistants uh, used to be able to like shadow showrunners and stuff like that. And now it's like I've had friends have to move back home after the strike, which was beneficial, obviously. And that the writers got such a good deal is like great. But we've also not seen improvement yet. Because it's like, okay, well, like you guys got that, but we're gonna have less shows now. We're gonna, we're gonna, get, uh, there's gonna be less money to go around because, because of your guys strike. So now there are less people that are allowed to be showrunners, or less people that are allowed to pitch themselves as showrunners. You, only if you're an established showrunner can you basically pitch shows to studios now. There's gonna yeah. be like some like once in a while miracles, like you know who you know, right? You get you get in the, the door that way, but generally speaking. It might be a minute before we find the next Shonda Rhimes. It might be a minute before we find the next J.J. Abrams. Actually, J.J. Abrams will be okay. If you're a J.J. Abrams <laughs> out there, you'll be all right. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah you'll, you'll be fine. Uh, yeah, but, you know, like like people that, that just don't have their foot in the door right away, you're, it's harder to get discovered, and it's harder to to be heard even. It's like, okay, you got to make a presence. You got to be on social media. You got to be on TikTok. You got to promote yourself. And it's like, those used to be jobs for other people to do for you and now yeah. even people like jen ortega coleman domingo coleman domingo who's been a great actor for for decades now but is finally getting like his time in the spotlight you know like there was conversations like oh maybe he's gonna get a marvel role he's gonna make a millions of dollars i gotta say something about that if you get a marvel role now and you have like a high profile team like he does you basically are lucky to make seven figures anymore off that like oh boohoo non million yeah. dollars whatever but just hear me out for a second like you have to pay so many people at that level of stature that it's almost not worth the job you could basically if you get enough good roles in other productions that pay like on on certain scales that might be better for you overall that aren't gonna Ooh. take up years of your life like don't take those roles it's Here's not going to be worth it. Here's my advice. If they offer you Rocket Raccoon, take it. There you go. Do the voice one. Only, yeah. You only have to do the voice. Like, someone else will even do the motion capture. Because they'll pay you. You'll have your name on the poster. You'll get a lot of profile. You'll do great. And then you can coast off that, and then you can become the maestro. But, like, it, it's... Yeah, it's it's so awful right now. And it's just... That's partly what this movie's about. And I think that's what people maybe respond to positively in this. But I just, it just doesn't fucking work, right? Like, yeah. It's it's not just me. It just doesn't. I took all these notes on this movie, and I realized looking back now how fucking useless most of these are. Like, because there is so much happens in it, um, and it's just like, it's bad. It's really what it is. <laughs> yeah, like, it got us all jazzed up fucking... about, like, very real circumstances about the industry history wise like in the past yeah it was and like the present, was, but it's like we're going in on it we're like yeah and then it's like oh fuck i gotta talk about the movie again <laughs> it's like everything <laughs> around the movie is interesting um, yeah i will now, say the fucking lee june lee i could just be wrong maybe but like her singing the fucking pussy song it it's sung by someone who's like it sounds like someone saying the word pussy for the first time. Like like their dad might come in the room and get them in trouble or something. Like there's that's the whole vibe of this movie, uh, man. It like, it's totally fucking is. When everyone's it, like, Oh, these party scenes are so crazy and like whatever, you don't have to have like partied super. Yeah, hard. yeah. I I've don't, I've partied. I've had don't, sex. Don't, yeah, yeah, we were we were yeah, we were like we, doing coke off of asses and there were there were whips and an elephant? That happens, yeah. right? Like it's like <laughs> it feels like a kid making shit up. Like. Yeah, and like again, specifically the elephant thing, I agree with you. I think that's when the movie probably works the best, like cleanly, anyways. But then there's like, I I just fucking I always like vibe like immediately away from this when Margot Robbie's on the dance floor, and then she like kind of stops right, and then she kind of like like starts caressing herself towards the ground and stuff. And I guess it's supposed yeah, they to do be the like. Big... 
like why is like, this a sensual thing but also like she's the she's in the the center of the room she's the spotlights revolving around her and shit and it's just like so banal <laughs> like it sucks yeah. it's, like look she's a she's a very beautiful star presence they're all, all this going shit's happening around her and i feel nothing yeah they're all going for it man um yeah it's but just it doesn't it really doesn't it also just feels like it just feels like it's made by someone who doesn't know what they're talking about you know what i'm saying like it in terms of just like i don't know it's like like martin scorsese can make a movie about cocaine energy because martin scorsese did enough cocaine to kill a small nation like (laughs) damien Damien javel like probably gets drunk after like two beers like it's you know, it just doesn't have that energy. It, it feel, like, that's the thing where it's like when it, it feels like so voyeuristic in a way where it's like someone who doesn't understand why people would do these things, you know? And, like, to bring it back to Wolf of Wall Street, it's like, that's a movie about addiction. The the sex and nudity in that movie is also unpleasant, but it, because it's about addiction, because no one's having sex in that movie for pleasure, they're doing it because of addiction, because they're addicted to it, which is not a pleasurable thing. You think it is, but it isn't right like it's that's what that movie is whereas this it's like everyone's having sex everyone's fucking there's like putting bottles in people's asses and like it's it it to what end you know like like what 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 is what are what is he doing with it right like is he saying like is and not to be on my fucking high horse, but like a little bit irresponsible to make a movie about Hollywood like this in the post Me Too world, where it seems to be the only lesson people have learned is that sex is bad and not that power structures are evil. Like it's a little irresponsible, um, but hey, because I think this is what conservatives think Hollywood just is. I'm just kind of fascinated by how much it doesn't work. Like it's it it. I almost wonder if this would be a good movie to be like, don't make a movie like this because it's bad. Like, the first... I, I did have a moment. Let me see. Um, oh, by the way, this is a movie where uh, a character goes and sees the jazz singer and comes out and says, everything's going to change. So, you know. Um, Although I will say, like, one one interesting thing about that scene is Manny seems less interested in the actual sound of the movie and more interested in how the audience responds to it, which is kind of the uh, hint that he's, like, starting to understand the game of it. Because he kind of becomes, like, a corporate tool, you know? Like, he, um, um, yeah. So, yeah, first hour of this movie kind of just is, like, dead on arrival. I wrote an hour in and I was like... Holy shit! How are we? How am I only an hour and ten into this movie? Because uh, I was already so fucking bored. And the and it does the crazy like, can you believe all this happened over just a day and a half? You know, with that first chunk of it, which is becoming a recurring thing in, in movies about Hollywood. Because that was that's Hail Caesar, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, oh yeah, huh? Both movies to do it better, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, mess. Um, I'll just say the yeah, I, like I have so many notes about like that first like like the whole like you know battle and shit like that and filming on the film sets and everyone running around. I don't Spike know Jones, of course, little cameo. Well, yeah, yeah, fuck him. Oh, um, I like but, Spike uh, Jones. I have, nothing, I have nothing against him, but it, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, so it's like because I saw that clip and I was like, okay, there's like something to this, and like anyone who's ever like especially been on a film set or been a runner and like it's not, it says it says. As fun as this movie tries to make it look and how worth it it tries to make it look, it is ultimately, like, worth it when you, like, nail it. That's that's absolutely true. It is also, like, not fun at all. And, you know, maybe the movie's yeah. not trying to make it look fun, but I, I think the score is often uh, in contrast to the movie's attempts at anything it does. I'm not, I'm not just trying to be flippant here. Like, I think this is a genuinely, like, bad movie score. I'm not musically yeah, trained, I, did, I didn't so want to be that like, guy, exactly... but it, it sucks. Yeah. <laughs> 
the score. Like, no, the, I, oh, the the fucking the, the the one everyone likes too with all the at the dancing in the beginning and the final montage yeah. at the end. The one everyone really likes. I'm like, I this is nothing to me. <laughs> I yeah, feel it's nothing. Bullshit. I'm sorry. God damn, people are it, fucking wrong, Diego. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah. Like, look, I like the music in La La Land a lot, much more than the the dancing sequences and everything else, basically. <laughs> I genuinely think that music is good. I don't know what happened here. I could not yeah. begin to explain what happened here. Um, uh, but yeah, you're mentioning like, um, like why did they make this movie this way and everything? And I'm such a big fan of Linus Sandrin that I even read up on like his process about this movie without seeing the movie. And he always shoots on film. Uh, maybe like one or two exceptions, but especially with Giselle, they're like big pro film guys. Like, you can't get the textures or the colors uh, on digital that you can with film. And it's all up there on the screen with Babylon. It, it, it kind of is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I actually, no, no, fine. here's the thing. I, I don't think it works, but what they're talking about, like in this interview with Kodak, because um, of course Kodak is like, okay, someone else is using <laughs> film again. Go, go, promote it, promote it. Kodak, um, <laughs> please don't let us die. Someone yeah. help. <laughs> I'm going to shoot film like three hours after recording today on like my film mm-hmm. camera. So I'm I'm like, I'm poking fun, but I do love what it can do sometimes. Yeah, yeah. A lot of, I guess the, the quote unquote purity people see in, in 35 millimeters specifically is a lie. Um, cause Linus Sandgren, like he shoots it like a crazy person. And I'm not just talking about like the camera whip pans and the dolly tracks and all that shit. I mean, specifically like how he's developing and shooting the film, um, in this interview with Kodak and I'll link it down below as well. And in, in the descriptions, um, he's talking about how like they would use like single source lighting for a lot of the darker sequences, which you're like not supposed to do on film. Cause like you lose stuff in the shadows. They're like gone. Mm-hmm. forever <laughs> um mm-hmm. especially with like reversal stock they shot on negative and so for those that don't know negatives are like the traditional 35 millimeter stuff you you scan it you reverse the uh, uh the colorization of the film that's how you get like so much detail in the highlights and the shadows that frankly is much more than digital I, I will say that you will you get more if you expose it properly you'll get more detail in film than digital that's just where we're at right now um reversal stock is like Kodak Ektachrome, which is what Tony Scott really liked to do. And that has like immediate drop off in the shadow. So the blacks are really black. The highlights are really bright. You, you don't get the highlights back with that one if you fuck it up. Um, and the way he exposed and developed this film on Babylon, it looks like Kodak Ektachrome. It looks more like reversal stock than shooting on like a, a traditional negative. And he got this look basically by... Like, people say, like, oh, they broke all the rules. No, like, he straight up, like, he would have gotten kicked out of, like, film school if he shot a short film or something like that, <laughs> the way he shot this movie. Other movies that shoot on 35 millimeter don't look this way because they're using, like, the older methods of, like, three-point lighting. You got to have your fill light, whatever. I always shit on, like, the Jurassic World movies directed by Colin Trevorrow because they look like shit. Um, and those are shot on 35 millimeter film. But he's not pushing it, the look of those movies in the film in any certain way that he can't do digitally. And a lot of movies that are shot in film now kind of have that look sometimes. Um, so what I'm saying is I really appreciate that they, they took the time to actually give it something more than just like, we're not going to let the film work for us. We're going to work for the film. They're going to make it like visually bold and like really textured and grainy Um Something that you can't just do digitally without like a lot, a lot of work and time and money and resources. And this still took a lot of time, money and resources, but I think it looks terrific. It's also maybe the wrong look for the movie. I don't know. I just find it all super interesting. It's yeah, it's certainly interesting. I don't know if it works for the movie. And also I watched on Amazon prime and it looked like shit. That's probably Amazon prime's fault. Um, (laughs) When you texted me, I was like, is that fucking, do they do streamers just do that sometimes? You know. Yeah, Amazon Prime seems to do the weirdest stuff. Like their subtitling sucks, and yeah, so it is a big like a big reason I'm getting back into fucking physical media is just because I can't stand how bad streaming looks now. Like it's just so yeah. awful. Like but, I'm scared to watch like the Batman on HBO ever. Yeah, because that's a terrific looking movie. If you have like a little hiccup in your streaming service or your internet service, <laughs> like you're not gonna see shit. <laughs> 
Well, when would HBO Max ever have a hiccup? Um, Rest in peace, uh, the Coyote versus Acme people. Oh, yeah, we're recording on the day of David Zaslav fucking up again and being a dickhead. Yeah, round two of being like, oh, by the way, we're not releasing the movie. Uh, what a fucking good game, asshole. idiot. Yeah, but, um, all right. So, like, an hour in, you get, like, the you get the first actually good scene in the movie that isn't about an elephant shitting, um, which I think is the, uh, the first day of shooting the sound movie. Mm-hmm. I think that seek. I think that like one brief sequence works really well, um, of just trying to hit the the tension, continuing to rise and the heat and stuff. I've been on film sets where uh, you have to turn the heat off so it doesn't affect the sound, <laughs> and uh, it can be an interesting experience, especially if an actor keeps fucking up. Um, and uh, there's a reason why Teller doesn't talk. I guess I'm uh-huh. trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, yeah, there's, um, that scene's good now. Two things. One, I like that scene better in the movie Living in Oblivion. <laughs> Anyone who's seen it knows what I'm talking about. I have not seen that two, movie. There's, there's a scene, there's, there's a very similar scene in it where, uh, Buscemi's character has a meltdown because, uh, what sounds like someone's digital watch starts beeping in the middle of a scene when they're <laughs> trying to shoot, and he just kind of has, like, a fucking breakdown. Um... And it's a great moment in the movie. Uh, so yeah, um, your movie should make a movie should make you think of another movie and like what oh, was better there with every scene in your movie. <laughs> um, and then that's, the other that's the really other thing cold, that, but that's true. <laughs> yeah, um, and then the other bad thing it ends on a really flat note with the guy dying, which is kind of a like I think pushing it a little bit to being like, I, oh wow, can you believe yeah. how to hand this got? And I'm like, yeah, well, better if he just like puked or something. Like I would have gotten the same effect. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, I, I kind of, I always want to like that scene more than I do. But I, I kind of, I would say that's my favorite scene in the movie, honestly. Hmm. Um, yeah. and I'm not just biased. Shout out to my pal Manny Leota, the sneezing man. Um wonderful director we we only run into each other at michael mann film festivals but we're like twitter ogs so it's just funny that we run into each other specifically at michael mann retrospective so shout out to him cool guy looking forward to what he does next um but yeah i, I think that uh there is something just a little inherently funny that something that small and specific could go that wrong that many times because you don't even yeah. have to relate to that specifically for movies. And I, maybe this is another reason, and this is kind of what I was holding on to. Um, that is like a universal feeling that like if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Versus the rest of this movie being specifically about like, well, movies are this, movies are that. People feel this way, people feel that way. About movies. And it's only about movies. That thin characterization, it's because they have to be mouthpieces for thoughts on cinema. And the industry. And to me, that's the ultimate failing of this movie in that it's too specific. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I think uh, there's like this belief now, and I, I do generally subscribe to this, where the more specific you are with your storytelling, the more universal it's going to be. Because mm-hmm. if there's something truthful to it, it will be universal. And that's why I think that's my favorite scene in the movie and why nothing else mm-hmm. really works very well. Yeah. I mean, there is that problem of this, so like, you're right with like it just the movie is just kind of only about movies and that's it. Like it, it doesn't really seem to be about anything deeper, um, because like there's the, once we get into like this sort of like everyone like falling apart in the final act when like Manny has his freak out on Margot Robbie and is like I've always loved you or whatever he's saying, and like what what is he what is all you've done is break my heart in that scene. Like when she comes to him and be like, Oh, all this money. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, it's so deeply unearned. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not just, like, what is their relationship by that point in the movie? Like he gave her a ride a few times and has like helped her career a bit. Like they've connected a little, but there's not like anything big going on there. Is there that I like missed? I don't think like, so. Again, it's why I think the movie might be a satire 
about Manny that he's like a piece of shit. Like that <laughs> he like he he, he he helped a woman once and then he's like, Well clearly we have this huge connection <laughs> And it's like you don't and I mean it's I mean there is a line in this movie when they meet um fucking what's his fuck? Spider Man. Uh, Toby Maguire? <laughs> Toby Maguire and he's like he tells Who also produced about, this like, by the way. Oh, okay. That's why he's in that role then. Yeah. Um, because he's not good. Uh, he's, no, he's not very good here. He, he, that was the I, here's the thing. Like I said, I skipped out on the last the latter half of this movie to go see the whale. Um, I I like people were like, my God, when when Toby Maguire shows up, this movie goes to a whole other level, right? Mm-hmm. Like people were like. People are talking about him like he's Alfred Molina in Boogie Nights. Right? Yes. Uh-huh. Right? And then you watch the movie and he's just and he... Alfred Molina in Boogie Nights. Yes. yes. Well, it's like, it's, it's, no, he's not Alfred Molina in Boogie Nights. He is me, Matt Garingo, doing an impression of Alfred Molina in Boogie <laughs> Nights. Like, it's, it's someone, it's like, it's, it's not to be that fucking person, but that's what it is. Like, it feels like someone being like, I'm trying to do this. Like, this is a big, important character. He's spooky. He's going to be insane. He's the, the tension is going to ramp up. And it's like, it's so obvious that, not to be that fucking guy, but I'm like, read a book, people. Like, everything here you can get other places. Like, ugh. It's a fucking movie, man. And... Yeah, he's so bad in this, but he has that line where he tells a story about, like, where he's like, he wants to do a movie with a dwarf. Like, it turns, like, everyone thinks this kid's really smart, but it turns out it's a dwarf. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, see, the joke is on us. And I'm like, is that what the movie is? Yeah. Um, and then, like, then, like, that leads to the whole, like, we go to, like, the fucking sex dungeon underground Epstein Island section of the movie. And, like,. It just sucks, man. Like, like I like that was when I was really like, I hate this movie. Like, <laughs> it's it's so bad. Like, it doesn't work at all. I'm embarrassed for the movie at this point. Like, it's like, oh, can you believe? Look at all these people getting fucked in the ass. I'm just like Jesus, buddy. Like, what the fuck? And it is trying to be something where it's like. Yes, Hollywood has become more respectable on the surface, but it has pushed all this stuff underground and made it worse, right? Mm-hmm. And it makes me wonder, though, what the fucking movie thinks about the fucking gay community. But, like, <laughs> hey, um, and we get, to the, we get to the fucking geek show, and it's just like, it's like, you're not gonna believe this guy, it's a rat. And I'm like, this, like, again, I'm like, fucking read a book, people. This wasn't that odd back in the day. This is, people used to pay money to see shit like this out in the open at circuses. Like, and I get it that that's, like, the early half of this movie is the circuses of Hollywood, but, it, like, it treats it like this bigger thing than it really is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you seen fucking Nightmare Alley? Yeah. Great like, movie. Nightmare, Nightmare Alley does this better. Like... Yeah, and that, that was one year before. Yeah. It's like... That fucking the ending to Nightmare Alley is so fucking perfect. Yeah, thing it's like that movie. I think that movie has a lot of ups and downs. The the uh, uh, Del Toro version, and mm-hmm. the problem is like the black and white one, the earlier one is really good too, but it can't have that ending because of the error it's made in. Mm-hmm. But like that ending is sells the whole fucking movie for me. Like yeah, it, from like it's any like, flaws never... I saw, like it's I'm so happy that the movie ended this fucking bleak. Yeah. <laughs> And it's a better statement about the industry than this fucking movie. Well, the the entirety of Nightmare Alley is building to that one moment. Like, it is... Yeah. Every fucking detail down to the wardrobes are building up to that last moment Mm -hmm. and that close-up. Where by the end of Babylon, if I could just jump well, to the ending. Well, no, no, but like just this is praise Nightmare Alley for a second. That is oh, a movie please. where you kind of watch it and you go like, I don't know if Bradley Cooper was right for this role. Like when you're first watching it, you're like, he's, he's like, I don't know if he's the right guy for this. But then you, that ending, it's like, oh, he was hired for that scene, mm. and only Bradley Cooper could have done that scene. <laughs> like, yeah. So it's like good that's, actor. Yeah. Oh yeah, good actor. He made a good movie last year called Maestro. I haven't seen it. It's good. 
People are wrong. I, I have to get Netflix back. Uh, a friend of mine just gave me their Netflix account to log into. So, or there are other ways to find these things. Yeah, but I'm always just so worried about viruses now or VPN stuff. Yeah. So I, just, I don't. I'm know. not tech savvy. <laughs> You gotta have the you gotta have the one laptop that you just use to download things. So like that laptop can like take the hit and you just do a system reboot on it if shit goes yeah. down. And then Maybe once you know, next file paycheck, is safe, I'll, I'll just buy yeah. a cheap laptop for that. Yeah, that's what you do. You buy a cheap one, use that for the downloads. If that one gets the virus, you just do a system reboot. And then <laughs> anytime it's good, you transfer it over to something actually usable. There we go. Yeah. So. Um. But yeah, yeah. Fucking what a what a terrific movie Nightmare Alley was. Yeah. Kind of flew under the radar. Like it did. Hey, failed award contender. I mean, maybe that's that's one we could do. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, to to go back to Babylon, like when you get to that ending, again, this entire movie, it's not that we don't understand what it's saying. We're just questioning why it's saying it. Yeah, I it's think one the those ending like... is exactly like oh yeah, it's like the um, Manny has that quote early on about like he wants to give himself to something bigger than himself or whatever. And then he realizes, oh, he was part of that all along through his experiences, and now he is part of the audience, and now he can share this experience by joining the world at large or whatever. He, he has a and that's like a beautiful of, statement. He has but... a vision of uh, David Elric's top twenty-five movies of the year montage, Aww. which is a joke I think I've made before on the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, but it's funny. Um, it's um, it's just that's what it is. Um, yeah. Although, yeah, I agree with you. Although, I think the ending has a different unintentional statement. Um, which, I think, it turns out he realizes he didn't care about being part of the industry at all. I think that ending is him realizing he just really wanted to fuck Margot Robbie. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's what that ending is. That he did it just to get laid. Which is what why people do a lot of things in life. I think that's a much truer statement than anything else in Babylon. You know what? I like that reading. Yeah, I don't. Th- I don't think that was his intention. No, but, no. But but the, speaking the, of like universal truths, yes, in this movie, we we I all mean... want to work hard to fuck Marco Robbie. Like, <laughs> no, not even her specifically. It's just no, no. If yeah, you yeah. Fuck just, someone. Yeah, you're gonna go to great lengths to 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 try and, and fuck with people, <laughs> and and you know it's. I get it, <laughs> which is There's a relatable a, feeling many people have. Have you ever seen Have you ever seen the Howard Stern movie Private Parts? No, you've brought it up before, and it's strange we, that we you might, brought it up twice. Yeah, it, we might have to find an excuse to do it, but there's a good scene in it where Howard Stern has to like drive this B movie actress around. This is when he's like married and stuff, mm-hmm. and she's like, "You should come up to my apartment." And so Howard Stern and his buddy Fred go up to the apartment, and uh, she's like. I'm going to take a bath and she gets like naked. Like, right. Like it's like, she's seducing him. Right. Yeah. And he's like, I can't do this. Like you're, you know, I'm married. And she's like, well, I need you to come in and like, help me take a bath. He's like, I can't do that. She's like, she's like, she's like fully naked. And she's like, well, if you keep your clothes on, then there shouldn't be a problem. And the movie like freeze frames and the narration is like, I don't know what it was, but what she was staying started to make a lot of sense. (laughs) It's like, yeah, sometimes people don't think correctly in situations like that. People will go to extreme lengths for fucking bullshit. Like, and I think that's what Babylon's about. Well, that's why it ends uh, with, like, the color tinting. It's, it's supposed to be, like... I'm, you know what? I'm not going to go there. Never mind. No, I was going to I was gonna make the same joke. Okay, okay, yeah. It's, 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 it's the metaphor for him coming. I mean, that's that's the joke with, like, everyone, like, all Kubrick movies are about erections. Like, where people are like, that's... Oh, yeah, I get that. That's what one is. Like, yeah. I mean, that one's actually might be true, because there is a lot of, like, erection jokes in his movies. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so. Which which also answers, my, not the erection thing, but the, the coming uh, with the, the tinted dye stuff from the, that they, they end the montage with. Because um, all the movies are shown, well, not consequentially, but, like, a lot of them are shown consequentially from um, Horse in Motion, you know, Rival of a Train, Annie Oakley, Trip to the Moon, yada, yada, yada. Um, they kind of bounce around back and forth, like between the 20s, 30s, 40s, back to the 20s, 50s, 20s, like whatever. Um, but then by the time you get to like, like uh, uh, Matrix One, not not the Wachowski's Matrix. There's a movie called Matrix One, 
in like 2001 and stuff like that that's when it's like it says like uh, Le Fin de Cinema or whatever it's like oh this is mm-hmm. like the end of like cinema now it's something else and that's when you get all the coding visuals right whatever and mm-hmm. it ends with Avatar and then it cuts to that image from Persona and when I first saw it and this recent time I, I had to f- fucking watch this movie over the course of a week because I was like I can't fucking do this <laughs> um, yeah I, it, it, it was when like it a ends with five Persona, hour event for me because I kept yeah. pausing it to take breaks a five part <laughs> limited streaming series event <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but when it ends on Persona, I was like, why did that one go last? The rest of these are mostly consequential or at least like related visually. Why did you put Persona after Avatar? And I didn't understand why. I was like, maybe he just likes Persona. But I was like, no, no, no. He's got to have done it for a reason. Have you seen Persona? It's been a while, but I have seen okay. it. Okay. Well, um, horny movie. Weird. Yes. Uh, uh, well, not, not, not super weird, but... um. Considering the the statement we just realized the movie ends on with Manny coming into the tie dye, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that Persona is the one that ends it. So I guess you're right. I guess now that you're right, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking of Persona Four Golden. Oh, okay. For the, for the PlayStation Vita. <laughs> what is that? It's a, it's oh a, no, it's the Persona games. I haven't played those. Yeah, they're good. They're good. Mm. Play them. Um. Interesting games. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, here's another question that I wasn't right. sure about. Um, I want to. I want to kill myself now. <laughs> we're still on the ending. Why? All right. So we, he goes to watch Singing in the Rain, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and he falls asleep in the theater, and then he wakes up with the mention of the jazz singer. So the movie wasn't actually doing anything for him. I mean, it's just the when it when it references the jazz singer. Why was that the choice? Maybe. Look, I've tried to give Damien Chazelle the benefit of the doubt as often as possible, but I think at this point, he is just one of those guys, like not not in a conservative or skeevy way, but I think he is kind of like a like a return guy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, like the old ways are better. Like this is when we used to make the old real ways shit. was best. Yeah. Uh, um. So that's what I think. All right. I was wondering if it was just more of like Manny is a monster because he can't pay attention to something that doesn't have to directly do with his life. Uh, maybe. It yeah. could be. So, he's a monster who ejaculated on the screen in public. So. Hmm. But hey, um, yeah, don't like the movie. Probably won't ever watch it again. Yeah, um, I'm good. I'm good. It'll take, um, and I I, I want to say I threw a I threw a post to Twitter. Be like people who voted for this. What do you? Why do you like it? And um, I didn't get any responses of notes. Okay. So, Dan Doherty just said the lead actor is very handsome, which I can't disagree there. Yeah, Diego but, Calva. Uh, um, you know what? He's not bad yeah. in the movie either. No, he's bad. No you offense think so? to the man. It's the character. It's not his fault. Like, because mm-hmm. it's just, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess of a fucking movie. Um, but hopefully he'll be fine. Although it looks like his next movie, Bird Box sequel. Oh, that already came out. Oh no! And no one cared. Um, but yeah, he doesn't. He actually doesn't look like he's doing anything right now. Good movie coming out called City of Dreams, which is an American Mexican Mexican drama thriller. Um, hmm. um I I hope he's gonna be okay. Cause you know what? Here's the thing. We don't like Babylon. A lot of people don't like Babylon. A lot of people also do like Babylon. Um, and I I do think this is going to be sort of an essential text for a lot of people. I, I call it like people's first crazy movie. And it's like, it's just not really. Like, but sort of like, like it's been I, embraced, I think I cop to like... But it's been embraced by film Twitter too. Like, Yeah. Like it's not going that? anywhere to our dismay. But, like, but, but it made what, an impact. What are they... Film Twitter, the fucking circle jerk of film Twitter, where, I mean, we're all part of it, where it's just like, I've seen movies like this before. Like, we did that six times in this episode. Like, mm-hmm. why is Babylon the one that gets the pass? What are you guys seeing in it that we're not seeing? That you're like, yeah. I heard someone, like, praise this for its lack of subtlety, and I'm like, I don't know if that's what the fucking movie is. Like, it's, I don't know. I think sometimes it's very subtle, and it's like, to the point where it's just not saying anything, and other times it's like, 
no, I got you. <laughs> I yeah. got you immediately. <laughs> Stop. Stop it right yeah. now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but I, the point I'm bringing up about, like, I think this movie's going to persist. I think people like Diego Calva are going to also persist. Um, I mean, look, he's not a he's he's a, he's not a white guy, so he might have a, a more difficult time. Unfortunately, I, I hope he doesn't. But um, I hope he continues to get opportunities. Gene Smart was in this movie. We didn't even talk about her. Legend no, I Jean mentioned Smart. her for like a second. She's great in it. Um, the movie should have been more about her. Um, she has a good scene where she talks about uh, like that scene with her and Brad Pitt is actually a pretty good scene. Um, yeah, it's I don't know if yeah, I like well, the words. Uh, they're I saying. don't know. I, I didn't really respond I, to that. I don't know if I like the words they're saying, but I like how like, <laughs> it's performed. You know, yeah. like uh-huh. um, Brad Pitt also has a really good scene in this where he yells and terrorizes his wife Angelina Jolie. I mean, um, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Who no? Who was that? I'm sorry, I mixed up. The, I mixed up the. Who was that actress in that scene? Was, like throwing furniture and stuff. Whoa! <laughs> I made a. I yeah, made just, a little mix uh, up there. I'm sorry. Yeah, whoops. Yeah, I'm but not cutting was, that because it was just a mix up because it, that wasn't Angelina Jolie. It was. It was just a mix up. I'm sorry. Yeah. And they were divorced by then, so that's on. Me. <laughs> I made a mistake. I'm sorry, um, everybody. Yeah, it would be. It, it would just be the wildest thing if, if, if some more stuff came out um, right it, it, as he's about I to get mean, cast as the lead of Tarantino's last movie. Or whatever, I mean, but, uh, what are the chances? I that mean, would, like, that would, Brad, we, no one knows anything, so I don't know. We would just, uh, it's, it, but he's, but he's Brad know. Pitt. What's Brad Pitt ever done? Everyone loves he, Brad Pitt. He, he eats in the Soderbergh movies. He's so good. He's good at eating food on the camera. Thankfully, David Fincher doesn't work with him anymore and works with people like Michael Fassbender. <laughs> Babylon. <laughs> Babylon! Alive and um, well, as it seems. Yeah. I, I think I probably had some other stuff to say, but I, I covered enough. Um, Jeff Garland is in this and looks like Harvey Weinstein. Oh, did they CGI him as well? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, that's so funny. Oh, look, Dad's here, too. It's just fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, CGI Jeff Garland. That's crazy. That's fucking insane. Um, yeah. If you want to see more of my boy Linus Sandrin's work, he also released... Or he, he also had a movie released last year called Saltburn, which you all didn't vote for. Yeah. Um, A much better looking movie, frankly. <laughs> They're trying different things. I think the look is more appropriate for that movie. Uh, and I don't yeah. even hate the look of Babylon. Again, I'm just... I'm a little indecisive on whether or not I think it works for the movie. Um, he also shot No Time to Die, which I still hold is a is a great action movie. A great blockbuster. I, I still director, really love that movie. That director must be going places. Yeah, okay, look, there's an addendum on basically everything I praise at this point, so just... No, I just I just think it's funny that, like, we keep fucking stumbling over these fucking pieces of shit. I know, it sucks. It fucking sucks. Please, everyone be better so I can praise you without having to be like, asterisk, by the way, yeah. just a heads up. Don't... What else did Linus... What else did Linus work on? Oh, Joy and American Hustle. Oh, boy. I like the look of First Man a lot. I think that's Damien Chazelle's yeah. best looking movie. No, that's a good looking movie. That movie sucks, but it's a I good like that looking movie. movie. That movie sucks hard, man. Um, not, like, not uh, to, like I said, uh, both movies, both First Man and Babylon. I like not to be like my fucking guy who like fucking watches the History Channel every now and then, but I like I'm kind of like fucking read a book, people. Like the, the real story is more interesting. Like, <laughs> mm. Not this fucking guy who's like, yeah. what if I was Neil Armstrong? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, uh, hey. Anyways, that uh, that's Babylon. Did you know uh, Neil Armstrong said yabba dabba do when he was on the moon? Is that Before, real? I believe that's true. Not Not depicted in First Man, though. Yeah, that might have tempered the emotional response people had to that. Yeah, it might have tempered what he was going for with that, which wasn't what happened, but hey. Hey, whatever. Remember the controversy um, about the flag not being in that movie and then the movie came out and the flag was in it? Yeah, that was what funny. Was that, what was that about? 
our brains are fucking broken and <laughs> and people are both very patriotic and very unpatriotic and somehow they're like there's crossover in between those two groups of people and uh people are dumb they just get angry about anything relating to the flag somehow first man made 105 million dollars that's kind of crazy that is that is bad anyways again that was babylon um for this season on the retrospective, I think we're just going to go in order of the movies as they're listed on the poll that we ran. So That's that's the decision will... right now. Well, we might mix it up depending on what happens, but Yeah, yeah. Uh... Um we always play it by ear. You know how we do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next week is The Truman Show, which beat yeah. Interstellar. Which yes. I did not think would beat Interstellar. <laughs> well, that was the closest one too, which was kind of crazy. Yeah, uh, Interstellar's forty nine point three percent to Truman Show is fifty point seven percent. Crazy. Oh, and for the record, because I know Saltburn has a lot of defenders and a lot of shooters right now, which is like fine. I, whatever. People know how I feel about that movie. The fact that it like got fucking creamed by Babylon was a genuine shock to me. It, I'll do the it, percentages it was... as as we continue the shows, but for this one, it was Babylon seventy six point four percent to Saltburn's twenty three point six percent. An embarrassing showing. For, like it's just what are you doing people like i thought people really liked salt burn like the people that like it like i knew babylon had shooters well but it, that was a genuine surprise to me well we we don't reach outside of film twitter do we like no everyone's, I, everyone's everyone who twitter. listens and votes is is film twitter for sure everyone's film twitter pilled and they're all uh diseased and so they wanted babylon instead because it's about the movies and People like this fucking boring movie for some godforsaken reason. Um, sorry, I'm I'm just baffled. Like, I really don't know what you people see in it. It's bad. I don't know, but like, look, look, whatever. Like, I'm at the point where I'm like, even if I fucking like hate a movie, which I kind of I kind of do with this one. Um, <laughs> people responding so positively to any work of art because yeah, it is but a work like, of art, but that like, art is still art. Um, but, like that but, is good and cool. If salt, if we do end up doing Saltburn, I do have a genuine take on that movie. All right, that is beyond the fucking movie itself. Like I have a genuine take on it. It feels like when people talk about Babylon, they defend Babylon in a way where it's like, Ooh, I like Babylon, and you didn't, and then I hear no interesting take on it, and I'm just like, well, why? Say something. <laughs> and it's just like because it's Babylon, and I'm like, whatever. Just, Maybe people just like saying the name Babylon. I think people like to think they're smart. No. I I thankfully know I'm dumb. So. <laughs> Fucking well, boring movie, man. I'm just like, I was kind of in shock on like, I was kind of hoping like something would unlock on rewatch and it just didn't happen. Yeah, so. no. No, not a single feeling other than apathy towards the movie and like, man... Movies are really great and horrible at the same time. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like, yep, I definitely got that feeling before and after I watched the movie. I would have had it without the movie, too. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Like, maybe, maybe we just don't really connect to it again, just because it's like we both have aspirations to do something related to film, right? Like, whatever those are. And this is a movie that's kind of like a joke on that, you know? Maybe, like yeah, every... maybe I'm, I'm well, just, like, defensive about it. Maybe well, again, I need that's... to be more vulnerable in regards to that. Well, like, well, again, that's why I'm like, is this movie a satire? Because it is. there is some truth to the fact that every story we hear about Hollywood is kind of fucking a nightmare, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it, where it's just like, you know... I mean, it's that thing where it's like, I think Jaws inspired more people to be filmmakers than any other movie because the story of Jaws, is of the making of it, is so thrilling, right? And mm. what's that story? That story is it was a fucking nightmare to make Jaws. <laughs> like, and it's like, you kind of have to be a fucking idiot to be like, yeah, that's what I want to do with my life. And that's why I'm like, is Babylon a satire on that kind of thinking? Like, is, is that what's really going on here? And I don't know. I don't know either, but. Matt, thank you for joining me. I'm glad we're back doing this. Hey, hey, everyone out there in the future. This is this is Matt. I'm here with Diego again. Um, this is hello. We're... Yes, this is an this is an addendum yeah. to the Babylon episode, which we recorded 
back on February 9th. It is currently February 19th. And uh, according to Diego, this episode should be out on Wednesday, which would be the 21st, if all goes well. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll see how that goes. No, it'll it'll definitely be up. Okay, okay. I just... a lot can happen in those two days, is all I'm saying. That, that's true. That's and true. we are recording this addendum, mainly at my behest, uh, because uh, we f- I made the incredibly stupid decision to front load the Babylon episode with a bunch of VTuber drama. And in these ten days, there have been uh, a lot of updates that I just wanted to clarify a few things. Um, mainly because it has spiraled into just constant harassment of people, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable leaving it on the note we did, where there was so much up in the air, and then people would go Google stuff, and then, you know, you know, you know how impossible it is to like search, uh, like Twitter these days, right, Diego? Like, it's yeah. it's become a nightmare, and so the people on the case, it, the the armchair detectives of this are people on Twitter people on Reddit, and people on 4chan. <laughs> so, not exactly the bunch I trust to narrow down exactly what's going on. <laughs> Why? What's wrong with 4chan? Hey. Is it, didn't, like, didn't, like, all the really... I don't know. I've never... Were you ever a 4chan guy? I was not, not a 4chan judge guy. I, I was a, a someone who was on Tumblr and would see the snippets of 4chan lore. Yeah. And occasionally brush up against it or occasionally laugh out loud at it yeah i think 4chan and reddit and twitter all have the same problem which is that like there are some incredibly good parts of those websites and then there are just like cancerous tumors attached to them right yeah (laughs) and they they tend to suck and then there's just there's culture there that convicts you like like everyone brands reddit as like really negative but i think i don't think all of reddit's bad you know no some some people you know especially the uh the roller coaster reddits I tend to browse. It's hard uh, to shout get. out to the analog film photography reddits subreddits. Right on. Uh, Isn't it cool. funny? It's funny how there can be those niche communities and then like people just dedicated to like ruining other ruining other people's lives. Yeah, and you know I'll I'll even say this is not the point of this update, but it's like every yeah. once in a while I'll like for example I found out how to get some really cheap uh, quality slide film. And it's like, oh, you, you just use the stuff that they, they branded. Uh, it's called Euphoric um, because they're like, oh, this this you could do this to make it look like you shot Euphoria. And it's like it's the same type of film. It's just branded a certain way and it's cheaper to get it out faster. Um, so, like, I'm going to buy that instead of, like, buying the more expensive stuff. <laughs> but then there's, like, people that are like, well, it's not real, like, film photography if you're not doing it this way. It's not you're not real if you don't use whatever the fuck and and so there's definitely corners of that but nothing like so, evil i've stumbled upon yet s- sounds like you got some beef with someone out there i i've got beef with with these fucking these nerds but it, it's nothing i yeah, yeah. it's nothing that's gonna destroy my life or anything i'm not gonna well, wreak vengeance well i've had my life ruined by this situation Oh, okay, that's great. I, I've had to go down so many rabbit holes of so many different people. There is so much misinformation out there, and there are, it's it's just turned nuts. And the only two sources you can really find on there are like people who are fiercely loyal to the streamers they like, mm-hmm. and people who are dedicated to destroying mm-hmm. the other streamers' lives. Like, those are the only two camps. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground there, and. At the end of the day, I, I don't have an answer as to what the fuck is going on. The only thing I can really say is that, at a bare minimum, uh, Ninja Sanji, the company that we've been talking about, um, is terrible <laughs> at running PR. That's that's all I can really say. Um, but, all right. Basically, the update is a few days ago, um, out of the blue, uh, basically, nearly all 32 members of... Uh, Ninja Sanji Ian on Twitter all tweeted out at the same time, and they were like, hey, there's f- watch this video. It's going to give an important update as to what's going on. Um, and so people waited with uh, bated breath as to what that would be, as uh, as you can imagine. Um, and it was one of those like really ominous, like just a black video, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, no. Uh, where we didn't know what the fuck it was going to be. Um and I don't know. I don't know all the people involved, because but one of them was Vox. So it's a video. 
it's it's about uh it's just it's it's very short and it's just a message from a few of them and uh it's from vox a streamer named uh alara and another one named ike i don't i don't really know them other than like their vague you know the vague interconnectedness of uh the the, the ninja sanji world mm. And they basically came out uh, defending themselves, and they said that, because the, the question was, were there people uh, harassing the streamer Selene uh, behind the scenes at Ninja Sanji? And they came out and basically said that Selene had sent a legal document right before her termination, which it, it seems like this was the reason she was fired, was this legal document, uh, th- threatening to sue Livers personally for harassment, Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and and uh, that's why they fired her, and now they, they're releasing this statement, and they basically came out defending themselves, being like, hey, we didn't harass her. We can't, we can't really provide any evidence because of NDAs, and, but we're standing with each other. And like basically all the, all the remaining, there's like 32 members of New Sanjin, and they all seem to be standing by each other, right? Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that, like... That hints that that might they might be right. You know what I'm saying? Like I I, I could believe yeah. a a group within the group is bad, but for all 32 of them to stand together, now it could come out later that they were all told like, hey, stand by these people or you're fucking fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's that doesn't seem to be the case. And there's but there are wild conspiracy theories out there being like, if you know let you know it's it's like fake news shit where it's like let's say if you like a liver and this liver is being like I stand with them right mm-hmm. you can be like well that's their manager talking that's not them and then you don't you can just say that like you can't actually yeah. prove or disprove it um so there's a lot of that now there's some other information that came out during this um one that i'm surprised has flown under the radar um and it, it centers around my boy vox is that um at some point uh Selen, uh recorded him without his knowledge Oh, uh, when they were on a Discord call, and uh, then included what she recorded in the legal document as an as evidence of harassment. Now the recording didn't seem to have anything to do with harassment. It more had to do with trying to find evidence that there was favoritism behind the scenes at Ninja Sanji, right? Mm-hmm. W- which she refers. To, I think she refers to it. She referred to it differently because she she confirmed this that this happened and apologized, but she referred to this as a distribution test, which I think is her way of, it's her way of saying favoritism, which I think what she was meaning that some people were being given resources that she wasn't being given at Ninja Sanji, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's her way of phrasing it. Um, She also says she doesn't know how it accidentally ended up in the legal document, um, which is a little odd, if you ask me. Um... And uh, Vox states that this was, a, he felt this was an incredible violation of his trust. And ultimately, favoritism, at most, it proves you work for a company that just sucks. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and, and um, but there, there's that. And then the other thing was, uh, I mentioned that before she went radio silent, she had released this song that immediately got privated, right? Mm-hmm. And then, so, so the timeline of events basically was, she releases this song, song's almost immediately privated, she releases a statement being like, I don't know why it's privated, radio silence for like two days, she puts a statement saying, hey, I've been in the hospital, I can't talk, month of radio silence, she gets fired, right? And so, in that like narrow window between the song getting privated and her statement about being in the hospital is when her self-harm attempt probably was, right? Uh, Which is like a big point of concern, you know? Yeah. Yeah. what what has come out since then um, is that she knew exactly why the song had been privated. She hadn't been given permission to post the song. Um, that stuff has to get like corporate approval before it can go out. And a, a, apparently she has a history of doing this where she will do something. She had done something. She had announced something she hadn't had approval to announce, then had to walk back the statement but then blamed Ninja Sanji and then later apologized being like, actually, I was the one that made the mistake. So she's, it's now look, that's all like bullshit, right? Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's just, 
it's it's a fucking song, right? Like I get it. It's corporate stuff. It's blah blah blah. I most of this stuff is there just to be like she had violated company policy, right? Like they didn't fire right. her without cause. I guess is the is the the long and short of it. Um, it's weird where I w- I've been reading so much of this, and basically what I found out is, um. I'm on her side, basically, with how Ninja Sanji's run. I think it's very poorly run. <laughs> I think an uh, unfair burden is passed off to the livers. I think there needs to be better communication and all this stuff. But on the flip side, I think she has muddled a lot of information out there that has led to a lot of people getting attacked for shit I don't think they did, right? Right. Like, it's, it's a weird... And I don't know... I still don't totally know what's going on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, do you have anything to ask? Just for well, I I actually know. curious. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure you're gonna agree with this, but like, we got we got to do something about NDAs because yeah, when it's like okay, we have evidence <sighs> to to report like essentially crimes, but we can't report it because or we can't give the evidence because of an NDA. Yeah, I feel there's there's got to be some sort of like we we got to yeah. work something out for like well, a legal loophole because that it's, that is just like so fucked up in every like facet, yeah. you know. Well, basically, what it's what's happening is both people are sitting on the answer, right? Like mm-hmm. both people have the answer as to what's going on. It would take one post of this evidence to clarify everything, and they can't do it, right? Yeah. Like, but both, and I, I actually I think it's. We can look at this as Ninja Sanji protecting itself. The way I read it, I think Ninja Sanji has fucked itself. Like, I think they're being fucked by their own NDA in not being able to release their information um, because they have to talk in such vague language it just makes everything sound worse, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Again, again, so far the evidence of harassment that is out there is this is this recording that she took without the other person's knowledge and then uh, people being like, hey, why did you lie on Twitter about why the song was privated, you know, like apparently people sent her messages about that and that was included as evidence of harassment, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's not exactly strong evidence. You know what I'm saying? Um, Yeah. 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 And uh, again, it's, but like, I don't want to say anything definitive because I don't know, there could be a change. And I think the other issue is unique to uh, Ninja Sanji is that if they're, I think, if their livers get doxxed where like we learn their real names and stuff that can have incredible legal ramifications beyond just the NDA. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you're not supposed to know who is who in the whole thing. Right. Now in all this research, it takes me about five minutes to figure out the real names of a lot of these people, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, not real names necessarily, but like they're, alter egos right like who they were right, right, right. before joining the Sanji or what they look like and stuff like that um there's that there's been a lot of that where i've, I've just found a lot of people's faces and they they it's been it's been a fucking journey i'll just say that um yeah the nda situation just sucks and it makes it worse for everyone now like i said like harassment has gone insane they're mainly targeting the three people that were that made that statement right mm-hmm. um and uh so like vox has been radio silent but he's been appearing on other people's streams right uh this bike person has done the same he's had his own streams actually since then alira has been totally radio silent hasn't said anything at the time of this recording which is the 19th a lot could change in two days and like there's been a lot of radio silence although everyone else in the company um all the other streamers i should say are just going about like you know, what they would normally do, basically. They're playing games, they're collaborating on things, they're releasing songs. That was the whole thing, is that someone released a song, and then that turned into a controversy. Why did this person have approval when the other person got fired for not having approval? You know what I'm saying? Like, So, everyone's in a shooting range right now. Um, now, one thing I'll say with that video that was released, the video statement, they've been community noted, which you can see. Um, and But the community notes leave a little bit to be desired. Um, uh, for one, uh, the video, the message, uh, where they said like, Hey, we're defending ourselves. The community notes basically said, Selene says that the only ones that, ha- um, the only ones that has, this is the actual phrasing. <laughs> Sorry. Selene says that the only ones that has mm-hmm. supposed to have access to legal document was her, her lawyer. And any color that Ninja Sanji's legal team. So that, like, the livers shouldn't have been shown this legal document was her claim. 
Now, I don't actually know if that's true. Um, I feel like if you mention someone in a legal document, you have to cut, if they're like an employee, like you have to let them know, especially if you're going to do an internal investigation about this stuff. Um, but I, I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, someone did like a whole thread on a document that came out that tried to put some of the evidence together. This document initially contained a lot of speculation about her mental health, about Selene's mental health. I'm not, they deleted it because they said they felt on retrospect it wasn't relevant and I don't feel it's relevant here, you know. I don't think that has much to do with it. Um, uh, but the, the, so this is the community note on this document that I use. Um, the document contains multiple downplays on compar and, and comparisons towards Selene's mental health and work life. It also completely neglects that Selene herself found out about her termination only after the announcement. And that's the only thing the community, the community note says. It doesn't address the many other things this document revealed, right? Um, there's a lot of people in the pocket for her at this point, understandably considering her situation. I still have a lot of sympathy for her regardless. And in terms of the inconsistencies with things she says, it's hard to tell. Like, I don't, I don't want to attribute, you know, you don't want to attribute to malice what can be attributed to, you know, incompetence, right? Uh, and it's, and she's clearly in a difficult state right now. Like, she's been fired from her company. She's involved in this legal battle. She, she had a self-harm attempt. I'm not going to fault her too much for making misstatements, you know? Um, I guess what I'm just saying is I don't, I don't know if there, there I don't know if there's a bad guy here, you know, other than the company and just corporate policy, right? And even then, the more I look at them, I'm just like, these guys are just fucking stupid. Like, I don't know if they did anything evil. Yeah, it sound, yeah incompetence. Yeah, it sounds really you know? like it's just incompetence all the way down. Um, Which is, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that's, oddly enough, another relevant point, mm -hmm. even to the the Babylon discussion, and, <laughs> and just reality, yeah. where it's, you know, we, we've talked about it before, there's no, like, evil conglomerate of supervillains, <laughs> like orchestrating stuff behind the scenes it really is just like a bunch of like incompetent banal fools yeah. who want to make money and hurt a lot of people in their their trials and doing and so if, if, you if know I had, it doesn't make it any better yeah. if i had to speculate i think the big thing that went wrong is that ninja Sanji have been trying to be like no no we were totally justified in firing her right like that seems to be their main focus and then they released a really tone deaf statement that was basically like we don't think this will affect our stock very much to like Japanese stock investors. And oh, like, this was like within like hours of it happening. So like that look, it's a really bad look. It's it. So to me, what it seems like is that they've put profits above everything else. Right. So they haven't, it's, mm -hmm. it feels like every decision was made really quickly and on the fly without much consideration to the consequences. Like it, it, it feels like everything was rushed and not thought out. And then it feels like they've been trying to explain themselves more in terms of why they fired her instead of being like, they should, at this point, they should just apologize to her, right? Like, mm -hmm. they just be like, hey, we feel bad, but like, this is just how it, sh we, we, if we go back and do it differently, we would do it differently. Now, the other detail that was revealed in this document is that uh, Selene had been given opportunities to graduate multiple times, which graduation is the term of, you know, leave gone am amicable terms as opposed to uh, being terminated from the company um, due to past conflicts. Um, and Vox even claims that she said to him once that she was going to get fired. And he said, if they fire you, I will quit, basically, in like solidarity with her. And that's his claim. You know, I don't know. I don't know the guy, right? Um, but he's he was very blunt in his statements, being like, I felt very manipulated by Celine. So he's very much coming out, like, not just, like, defending himself. He's very much coming out being like, I was manipulated, and I don't feel good about what happened. Um, but that's been his last statement mm -hmm. on the matter, essentially. Um, now, again, depending on who you want to believe, people are like, either Celine's a monster or Vox is a monster, right? Um Right, right. And in terms of the vague statement of like what the harassment is, we still don't know what that constitutes, right? Like, she's been vague about it too. And then also, uh, she initially kind of came out of the thing, guns blazing, being like, I will not be silenced. And now she's kind of walking back, statements being like, you know what? I want to keep all this private. I have information, but I don't want to release it. So that's made things even more challenging. 
Uh, in her, in, in a more positive thing from her though is that uh, after one of her earliest streams, um, she did a uh, she did a stream that raised. Um, at the time I said what yesterday it was at just over six thousand dollars. The goal is ten thousand dollars for uh, mental health support. Um, collected for uh, Mental Health America, a nonprofit, right? So she she used because mm-hmm. she has gained she's gained a massive following in only a few days. She's almost at five hundred thousand followers on Twitter in just a few days after leaving the company. And some real sickos, in my opinion, this is a little fucked up. I'm not I don't appreciate this. Have been matching, have been comparing her rise in subscribers to the fall of Ninja Sanji Livers uh, numbers and of subscribers, which uh, that seems a little a little wrong to me. But hey, um, mm. uh, let me just check one last thing. I honestly, there's so much still happening that I feel like by the time we finish recording, like they could announce that like half these people are fired and like mm. shit has gone down. Um, well, I'm just gonna check one last thing and then, then we can then I can fucking stop this nonsense. Uh, yeah, you're good. Um, you're good. Yes. Uh, Ninja Tiny released a statement about the sharing of information. They're like, we want to correct something. In order to check the val- validity of Selene and her lawyer's claims, any color shared only necessary parts of the information sent by her lawyer with our livers and led an internal investigation. Um, to begin with, any color, that's Ninja Tiny, has not made any confidentiality violations regarding submitting documents for legal claims such as these. However, regarding the specific information and documents, with Selene's lawyer requested that we do not share with our livers. With utmost consideration of the request of any color, any color ink has not shared any such information. Um, in addition, our livers are not held to any confidentiality obligations regarding the information shared to them from any color. Thus, there are no legal issues regarding the information shared to the public in the stream made by our li- livers. And that sounds like a bit of a legal workaround to getting some information out there. Um, but it's very specific. Language. Yeah, it's, I mean, well, that here's here's. Here's the thing that was driving me nuts about people. So that, like, the video comes out, right, where they all make these statements about, like, defending themselves. And people were like, mm-hmm. this is so clearly written by a lawyer. Like, like it was like a deceitful thing, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course it was written by a lawyer. Like, it's gotten to the point where it's there's legal shit going down, you know? Like, they'd be stupid to come out yeah. and just speak off the top of their head. Like... I'd consult a lawyer too. Like that's so like it, there's a lot of armchair legalese going on, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And then another thing that just kind of happened in it, which is partly this was probably think it's like someone started a like, hey hashtag Ninja Sanji positivity. Let's just share some positive things to kind of make the livers happy. This is part of the parasocialness of it all, right? Like someone mm-hmm. started being like, just share positive things, and that was. It started positive, and then that specific hashtag was quickly monopolized by people who just wanted to harass people, right? Which I don't think helps yeah. anyone. And it, no, probably yeah, not. Yeah, and it, it was just, it it left a bad taste in my mouth, and that was kind of what made me want to come in and be like, all right, let me just get some, let's just let's just correct some of the information that's out there. So, um, yeah, it's a fucked up situation. It's Again, I'm in this weird pocket where I agree with her. I don't know. Here's the thing. I think... If I'm going to be as cynical as possible, right, towards Salem, which I don't want to be, and I'm not saying this is what I believe, but if I'm being as cynical as possible, what I think happened was I think she was frustrated with how she was treated at Ninja Sanji. I don't disagree with her frustrations. I believe reading what is expected to be covered by her as opposed to the company and the process she has to go through just to get very basic things approved, um can be very frustrating as, as it seems. Um, I'm on her side in that. Um, but I think the way she's being treated was not unique to her. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, I think this is how all the livers are being treated there. And then I think because maybe either livers didn't stand with her or she wanted to make it seem like she was uniquely singled out in this respect. She added this claim of, harassment but again like i don't know if there could be way more that's that's me that's my me at my most cynical right like that's me at my mm-hmm. most reading between the lines on the thing um 
and I like I don't know. It, even that seems like a stretch to me, right? Like none of it really adds up perfectly. Um, but the fact, that my whole thing, the big thing for me is just like the fact that all the Ninja Sunny and streamers have stuck together makes me think that at least that there's not this like toxicness going on behind the scenes that's being hinted at. Um, and maybe there was just this sort of interpersonal conflict that kind of blew over. I mean, I don't know when Vox found out he, he had been recorded, but I would be fucking pissed if I found that out. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. that one is a, that, it, that seems really big to me and it's like barely being talked about, you know? And, mm-hmm. um, that one really like, uh, it's like kind of missing forest for the trees. Yeah. And like all the stuff, like I'm trying to be on her side cause I really feel for her and like her mental health struggles, you know, like as someone who's gone through his own bullshit, but like that one really rubs me the wrong way. Um, but yeah. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to clear up some stuff. And again, it's, it raises more questions than it ultimately answers. But, um, I guess this is a long way of saying, uh, don't watch VTubers. <laughs> it will ruin your life. Well, I'm glad you went on this journey so we wouldn't have to. Oh, God. I'm so, I'm so, like, and this, and that's, I do kind of feel bad for the fans because I feel like a lot of them, like, you get into this stuff for similar reasons, which is, like, you need at least some space online that you just use to take your mind off things, right? Like, we all need that one. Yeah, yeah, and then that gets fucked up by reality and as I, well. And I think mm-hmm. that is the main reason why people are so vitriolic about this, because what is most threatened here is that bubble, right? Is this sort of this belief in like this perfect, like oh, the person I love is this perfect being, and anyone that disagrees with them is a monster, right? Like. And I think there's a, I think that the fact that, that bubble is being threatened is what is leading to a lot of vitriol. Now, also in my personal experience, just going through this, um, the people defending the various livers seem less toxic than the people attack that the people attacking Ninja Sanji and the company. Now, I think that's more just the toxic people that are looking for any excuse to be toxic have latched onto the that side but that's just my personal experience a lot of other people seem to be more in the middle of like we don't a lot of the the fans seem to be like i love the streamer i like but i'm still like i still don't know what the answer is as to all of this you know and then of course other a lot of people are like you know there's a lot more streamers being like i'm taking a mental health break and in fact today it's someone i don't know the this streamer but it's someone's birthday over there and i told you earlier about how birthdays are like a big deal and she's not even streaming for it, which is kind of rare, um, because she's taking a mental health break. She made a statement being like, hey, thanks for the birthday wishes, but that's about it, you know? And normally they also release merchandise and shit along with it, and that also hasn't happened. Um, I think that's more just because anytime Ninja Sanji E and corporate tweets anything at this point, they just get swarmed with people being like, fuck you. But, uh, so, it's one of these things where, honestly, it could all shake out that, like, everyone's innocent no one did anything wrong and i still don't think ninja sanji can recover because they've done such a terrible job handling this right like it's it's i don't i don't know how they come back from it you know what i'm saying like because a big maybe they don't yeah or maybe they just plow ahead (laughs) well i mean well here's the thing they're trying to plow ahead but i think a big part of it is like they have to have merchandise deals they have to have uh they have to collaborate with people outside of the Ninja Sanji stream, right? Like, you have to have this, mm-hmm. there's like a whole VTuber community full of different companies and different independents, and you need to have their, you need to be in their good graces, and now who's going to want to work with them? You know, who's going to want to collaborate with them in the face of all this? Uh, and then it's like, you know, conventions have these people, like right before this whole thing happened, there was like a big one at I think Anime Expo where it was like, go to this hall and it's like all the ninja sanji people like singing and dancing and shit like that and uh it was i like i'm like our convention's not going to invite them anymore because that would be a big deal right like Mm -hmm. so it's like they it could it, it could be one of these things where yeah like they don't they ultimately don't turn the brand around um which would be a shame for all the people who because it seems like even if the people i've mentioned did do something wrong it's that's there's still 32 people and so there's around you know 25 to 30 who did nothing wrong apparently um and to have their livelihoods fucked with would be really fucked up you know um but Mm -hmm. yeah it's a fucked up situation although now like i'm in the woods i just 
it's got me caring about things I didn't care about before, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, cause I just watched the guy for like streams and stuff. And like another component of the VTuber thing is like performing and like singing and like going on, like they hold, they help, they hold virtual concerts, right? Like where yeah. you watch like a 3d version of them dance on the stage. And then like a 3d model of yourself can be in the stands waving virtual glow sticks and shit. And there's all this controversy about how uh, most, I think most, if not all, of Ninja Sanji Ian, they haven't gotten 3D models yet, despite them being around some of them for like three years. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. And I'm like, and like, it's something that like, I don't give a shit about, but I'm also here being like, yeah, why don't they have 3D models? <laughs> like, it's something I never gave a fuck about, and now they've tricked me into giving a fuck about it. And I've ruined my life. I've broken my brain. I apologize to everyone who had to sit through this. Um, I thought it would just be kind of interesting to tie it in with the Babylon episode. I was also angry you people voted for Babylon, so it's partly your fault. But um, <laughs> but now, uh, hopefully nothing insane happens in the next two days. <laughs> Um, we'll have to keep updating the episodes yeah, we'll have to, constantly. And um, I don't think I will. We won't do another update on this because we don't really talk about VTubers for the episodes we have recorded so far. But if 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 shit changes, you know, may, if I feel the need to, but I feel like this is going to be the last time I talk about this specific incident in such detail. Um, mm. Unless like this is like the climax of the retrospective. <laughs> but. <laughs> um, but um yeah uh we'll see what happens fox akuma is in is in some hot water right now i'm i don't know what's gonna happen well i'd say stay tuned but don't 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 run away run fucking <laughs> far the fuck away get the fuck <laughs> out people but stay tuned to the retrospective yeah which we will continue We're, momentarily yeah uh, next episode's truman show I don't, uh, and then uh, we're about to record the Fargo episode, so yeah. <laughs> so in case you want to keep so, keep up to date with our timeline, in case something horrible befalls one of us, um, in case we have a big falling out at some point in the in the, <laughs> the next few days, and then I start tweeting vaguely about Diego and his controlling atmosphere on the podcast. I, I'm going to go out on a limb. If there is a falling out, it will probably be my fault. I'm just going to... No, no. Controlling atmosphere sounds like me. No. Especially with this podcast. No, Diego, you, you, here's the thing. Here's... Look. Diego's a great person. Diego doesn't have a controlling atmosphere. Diego has a... Sometimes I have to wait five days to get a response from him. <laughs> but it's usually about bullshit that doesn't... I, I think I've been getting better. He's been getting better. But and to be fair, it's always... It's usually about bullshit that doesn't matter, Right. So, like, it's not like I was like, Diego, I need the test results immediately or I'm going to die. And then I don't hear from you. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but hey, um, yeah, stay tuned for this drama. This is an exciting season of the failed awards contender, I, I see. There's as much drama in this series as there is in Babylon, which is to say not very much. But, um, Aww. hey, um. Oh yeah, now now we can shift back to the regular outro to the episode. Yes. There yes. may be a, a, a break at some point in this retrospective, but uh, uh, unless anything happens, we will continue on a weekly release schedule with these. Um, and if we don't, please bear with us. Um, but thank you everyone for voting, for tuning in. Uh, next week we're talking Truman Show. Matt, where do you want the people to find you online? I don't fucking know. All right. Links down to our <laughs> stuff below. Again, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching. We have been professionally unprofessional. Bye. Goodbye, Jonathan Demi. Bye.